Yeah, I'm Philip. Um, come all the way from London, and um, I'm the uh, London chapter leader of the Western A Price Foundation. Have any of you, any of you, familiar with it? Uh, this group? No. Um, that's great. I, I actually um, got into all this originally through the sort of things that we are changed and talking about. Um, I became aware of a lot of problems in the world and I settled on this as an issue to, to deal with. And I guess probably quite a few of you are aware that there are a lot of um, health issues which, you know, conspiracies around them and um, causing our problems in society. Well, the Western A. Price Foundation uh, promote wise traditions in food, farming and the healing arts. And um, we like to say that we challenge politically correct nutrition and the diet dictocrats. Um, so it's very different to what um, mainline nutritionists are saying. Uh, almost 180 degrees to, to what you'll hear almost anywhere. And um, which is quite overwhelming if you, if you come over to the point of view that um, these are things that need to change to, for us to bring back our health then, and, and our cognitive ability, our ability to engage with the world and, and be productive human beings. Um, you, but the, the good news is that a lot of this will be familiar to you. Probably a lot of the things you may recognise in what your, your grandparents did, you know, um, and, and a lot of the traditional foods that we're told not to eat. So, um, this talk was written by um, Sally Fallon. Um, she does this talk. She's actually doing it at our conference um, in March, so maybe we'll see some of you there. Um, now, yeah, what, what's a healthy diet? We, we've all heard so many different options. Um, Sally likes to say that these are all um, themes and that they were all created by men who never had to feed a, a, a large family. Um, so, no. And, and there's a lot of confusion now because these things come in and out like fashions. So, you know, what we're here to, to, to ask today is what is a healthy diet, really? Um, is it the official government diet? This is the American one, the food pyramid. And this is what's being pushed through the World Health Organization. And you probably have seen in the news about fat taxes. Um, even David Cameron has said that we, we need a tax. And this is going to be on, on salt, sugar. Anything with more than 2.6% fat will, will get punitive taxes. Um, what you'll notice here is at the bottom, it's almost entirely grains. Um, we, we believe that this is really the grain cartels just pushing their products on us. Um, so we, we believe this diet is designed to promote the products of commodity agriculture. Um, and this is the English version. And what you'll notice is almost well over half of the calories they propose are carbohydrates. Um, and, and we believe that this is really the seat of the obesity epidemic. Um, prior to 1983, the UK government didn't have this guideline at all. They focused on nutritional deficiencies. And they suddenly decided that, um, that we were no longer nutritionally deficient and we were eating too much all of a sudden. Um, and, and really, since then, obesity and diabetes has taken off. And the explanation for that is that, um, that the new low-fat, politically correct diet is packed full of carbohydrates, which are all broken down into sugars. Uh, and the body's really been overloaded with carbohydrates. Uh, and also being malnourished, because a lot of the nutrient-dense foods we're being told not to eat. Um, where we... Where we begin is um, through Dr. Weston A. Price. And you know, it's the name of the foundation is the Weston A. Price Foundation. Um, Dr. Price was America's top dentist in the 1930s. Um, he he st set up the, Ameri the research wing of the American Dental Association. And he traveled the, uh, the world for about 10 years looking for isolated tribes because he was convinced that um, the problems he was seeing in practice were to do with nutrition. And he'd seen so many pictures of um, isolated tribes that showed perfect health. And, and what he noticed was they had wide, broad jaws, all the teeth fit in, nobody needed braces, and there was no evidence of tooth decay in any of the photographs. 
and he later confirmed this. So, um, here's a little photo. Number of the Hey, you're a fine, big, strong fella. How old are you? You look as though you were a giant. My, my. Where'd you come from? Well, that's the place. The most universal disease in the world is the decay of the sea. And unfortunately, we have not known the cause until we've gone to the primitive people to find how they prevent tooth decay. Our difficulty is that we are adding too much white flour and sugar and do not get enough of the foods that carry the minerals and vitamins. When the primitive people adopt the food of modern civilization, their teeth decay just as ours do. I spent several years studying the primitive people in various parts of the world, and I've come as a missionary from them to the people of modern civilization. And I beg of you to learn of their accumulated wisdom. And if you do, you too can have strong, healthy bodies without so much disease as we suffer from these days. That's the only video we've got of Dr. Price. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> and, and you can see it's a very warm, warm guy, very likeable. And so basically, he was saying that you know um, we need to learn from the wisdom of. Oh, so what I start off with 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 photographs that he took. So he, he went. He used to go to a tribe. He'd line them up after he'd, he'd spoken to the elders. I explain what he was doing. He'd count all the cavities, um, check the, the dental arches, see, see the health, um, and, and take photographs of the, these people. And he would then take samples of the food, take it back and analyze them for nutrients. Um, and, and he would do the same with um, people nearby who had access to uh, modern foods. So the first place he went to was in Switzerland. Um, this, um, this village. Um, the only access was a dirt track, not even big enough for a cart, so we knew that all the food was produced in the valley, um, except for sea salt, and we're going to get into that later. Um, now, um, the, the, um, the diet was primarily based upon um, on, on unpasteurised dairy from cows which grazed just underneath the glacier line. So almost, you know, the predominant amount there food was like full fat milk, cream, butter, cheese, um, and, and they had sourdough bread and just some small amount of vegetables in the summer. And, and what Dr. Price found was they had this perfect um, health, hardly any dental decay at all, and um, wide dental arches again. Were, and one of the interesting things was they didn't get tuberculosis, which was rife elsewhere in, in Switzerland. And Raw milk was actually being blamed on, on tuberculosis. Uh, 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 raw milk was being blamed as a cause of TB, but these guys didn't get it. Um, the, the children were, were very hardy and they would play barefoot in very, very cold streams that most people would be uh, freaked out by. And um, well, uh, the. the um, one thing that was common to, to all of these tribes was they had a sacred food which was reserved for pregnant women um, and the father as well for conception and, and children and, and then people who were sick and their sacred food was um, butter which was produced from cows eating fast growing grass in the spring and we, we've later found out that that is um, Dr. Price called that fact, the factor X we later found out that's vitamin K2, from um, which which comes from the green grass, and um, the, these um, sacred foods that each of the civilizations had tended to be the cholesterol-rich foods, which actually we're told not to eat nowadays, and they're very rich in vitamins A, D, and K. Um, and th this is another thing that um, that was done, that the breads were um, sourdough bread. So you have tried sourdough bread. Um, well, what, one of the things that um, traditional people did that, um, that isn't done today is that they would treat their grains, um, they'd be very careful to prepare their grains properly. Um, grains are actually have lots of toxins in them because um, if you imagine yourself as a grain, if you're eaten by an animal, you want to survive the digestive tract and then sprout later on. So they've got inhibitors. Uh, digestive inhibitors. 
Um, and, but when you um, soak, ferment, um, or sprout grains, it tricks the grain into thinking it's landed on fertile ground. And um, all these toxins are neutralized. So, um, yeah, they, they would have this um, bread, which modern breads will not confer the same health benefits. Now, just down the road, um, th these guys had um, access to modern foods like white flour, canned foods, pasteurized milk, and um, we saw te there's terrible um, tooth decay, lots of tuberculosis, lots of disease. And uh, one thing to bear in mind when you look at these pictures is that if you didn't have modern dentistry, modern medicine, a lot of people today would, um, would, would look like this. Um, he, the next place he went to was the Outer Hebrides. And these people, um, they, only, they, they primarily ate fish. It's a very different diet. Um, but they ate the whole fish. Their sacred food was, um, believe it or not, was baked cod's head with um, chopped liver and oats in it. Um, we, we go into a lot of depth about how liver is particularly nutrient dense, a lot of the organ meats, and we're not eating those anymore. Um, they, they didn't have, um, the, the only green vegetable they had was, it's not vegetable, they had seaweed, but no other plant food um, other than the, well, they had oats, but that, that was it. So it was seafood, oats and, and, and seaweed. But uh, they had a, an incredibly good, um, one of the things he noted about them was that um, they were all very positive people, bleak landscape, but they're very spiritual and very, um, very joyful people, very positive. Um, th this is one thing that, that comes up all the time about soil fertility. When you look at the Swiss, when they're grazing just under the glacier, that's where the minerals are, where the glacier is rubbing up and down, uh, releasing minerals into the soil. Um, now, in the Outer Hebrides, they, um, here, um, they had a very interesting way of uh, fertilizing their soil. The, the thatch was changed each year. They, they didn't actually have a chimney, and they would have peat fires. And um, the, the, the rooms would be full of smoke. Um, all year round, uh, they kept the fire going. And the, the rich smoke from the peat would seep through the um, thatch and turn it into this incredible fertilizer when it was composted down. Um, and, and interestingly, when, when the modern um, health officers came onto the island eventually, they told the locals, sorry, you can't live in here, this is going to cause tuberculosis. They didn't have a tuberculosis problem. Um, but they, they found that actually they built a house for these guys and they would still keep the cottage going and the fires running, even though they weren't in there, because they knew it would give them healthy uh, oats. And it was a very thin soil. So this was an experiment Dr. Price did when he came back. These were oats grown in the, the virgin soil from there. There was increasing amounts of the compost that these guys make. Um, and he, he went out to um, the Eskimos in, um, in, in North America. Now you'll notice these are very sturdy chaps, these little babies. Um, the the um, the diet over there was um, very high in animal fats, probably about eighty percent animal fat. We're told that animal fat's going to kill you. Well, um, th these guys um, they they would eat fish, and they would actually ferment their fish. We get into a lot of stuff about fermented foods being a good thing, and sourdough bread's another. <coughs> It's a pre-digestion, really, which um, all traditional peoples would, um, would, would in, involve fermentation. And they would um, eat um, the, uh, the seals, which are very fatty as well. One of the, um, the, the, the key um, food combined, they had, they had one uh, key food combining thing where they would not have lean meat. So everything was dipped in seal oil. Uh, and we see this a lot as well. You know, today we're told always eat lean meat. Um, but you know, the, these babies were really tough, and um, wherever you went, um, wherever Dr. Price went, he was told that you know, they didn't cry, they would sleep well and um, not suffer like modern children. But as soon as they went on the modern food, you would get children crying, children not sleeping, having the sort of problems that uh, modern children have. Um, th these are uh, some really healthy guys. 
Um, some of the teeth are actually slightly worn down because they would chew on leather a lot um, for various reasons. Uh, but even when the teeth were worn down, they had the nutrients that they needed to, to avoid tooth decay. Um, and and these, these guys uh, were near uh, missionary posts and, and trading blocks where they had access to canned foods, refined processed modern foods, uh, and, and you see the sickness coming in. Um, but what Dr. Price was mo most worried about was the next generation. The second generation on, on um, low nutrient modern foods, they, the bone structure would begin to change because the bones need a lot of nutrients, particularly those fat soluble vitamins A, D and K. Um, and the, the, the jaw starts to become thinner because the, the body is focusing on other things. Uh, and the, that's why the teeth don't fit in. If you've got a, so we believe the need for braces is actually malnutrition. And if you walk, I was walking down um, Manchester High Street today, and I couldn't believe how many children had braces. And um, just going to bones, has, has anyone eaten bone marrow before? Yeah. Uh, there's one thing that I recommend you just try, even if you don't eat it, go to your local butcher, get some barrow, bone marrow and cook it up. It's almost entirely saturated fat. Um, so, you know, when people have bone problems today, they say, keep on a low fat diet, eat powdered calcium. It just doesn't work. The fractures that women are having are actually tend to be the, uh, the large bo uh, bones with more mo bone marrow, actually more uh, fat deficiency. But th these children would um, suffer a lot of the <coughs> illnesses as well. Um, so this is a picture of um, a very happy chap with a, a bag of seal oil. That, that's just tons and tons of oil uh, from seals. A very rich um, food with a lot of um, vitamins in it. Um, and, and this was their sacred food. Um, but these um, are salmon eggs, um, you know, like, a bit like caviar. Now, um, <coughs> the, one of the funny things about politically correct modern nutrition is they say, well, don't eat meat, but eat fish because you want to avoid cholesterol. In fact, Fish are actually tend to be higher in cholesterol than uh, than land animals, and and one of the hu richest, highest sources is is fish eggs. And I tell you what, um, if you can't deal with salmon roe, you can always get cheap herring roe. Actually, tastes delicious from even from um, places like Waitrose. And um, so this was reserved for children, um, for for parents who were going to conceive. They they would spend about two years before con conception focusing on really eating lots and lots of this um, nutrient-dense food. Um, mo moving on to the um, native Indians. Um, unfortunately, most of the native Indians have been decimated by uh, American uh, reserve policies, you know, um, putting them into the reserves and stopping them from doing what they used to do. But you can see this beautiful bone structure uh, that they had. Now, there was one reserve where Dr. Price found healthy Indians, but it was just one out, and they had a dairy farm on site where they had unpasteurized milk from grass-fed cows, and there was a real emphasis on nutrient-dense food, and they didn't allow these Indians to have white flour and sugar and that kind of thing. Um, so, but here are some North American Indians in Canada where they still did have uh, hunter-gatherers. Now, these guys, they didn't grow vegetables. They were... They led a nomadic lifestyle. They hardly ate any plant food at all. Um, so they were hunting animals. Um, now, there's, there's one kind of myth about sort of hunter-gatherers that they would have eaten lean meat, because you look at um, all the wild animals, they tend to be quite lean. Well, the surprising thing that Dr. Price found about these people, again, there's a real emphasis on fats. They would tend to eat the, the fats and the organ meats. And um, as I said, when Dr. Price tested these, found that's where all the vitamins were. Um, you think it makes sense because the organs are, are carrying out the, the major processes in the body. Um, there was, uh, uh, and when uh, the hunting was good, they would feed the lean muscle meat to their dogs and they would only eat um, the, the organ meat and the fat. And, and, and then there's this um, amazing food, if any of you want to look it up, called pemmican, where they used to cure the, um, the lean meat, just like biltong, shred it up and put it into kind of a, a bag 
usually made out of, um, sort of guts from an animal or something. And they would pour animal fat into it. So it's just this really rich food. And there's examples of people living off on this for, for years on end. And apparently, I haven't tasted it. I think, I think you've tasted it, haven't you? No, I'm not. No, you haven't yet. Right. I've made it. Um, oh, you've made it? I've made it, yeah. Well, maybe you could say how it tastes. It's nice. You can make it, um, the thing is to dry the meat. So you can do it at home in a fan assisted oven. <laughs> So you just dry, right, cut very right thin strips of meat and dry it at low temperatures so it doesn't actually cook, it just dries out. And essentially then you just get it in a food processor um, and then shred it until it's a fine powder. Then you mix it with a rendered fat, so say like goose fat or something. And then if you want to, you can add things like dried berries and currants. So you make it and absolutely really, and then you like flatten it and make cakes out of it and it travels quite well. And it's just incredibly, dense form of nourishment. Yeah. Why okay. can't you bring the samples? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't make any. <laughs> and, and this, this will start making sense when you, when you realise that <coughs> protein metabolism requires the fat-soluble vitamins A, D and K. And I'll talk a lot about those vitamins. <coughs> so when you're having lean meat, the body really struggles to metabolise the protein. And that leads to the body draining its own resources of these vitamins and then illness comes out. And it used to be called uh, rabbit hunger. When, when there was big poverty and people could only eat rabbits, very lean meat, you, you got what was called rabbit hunger. Um, so again, here's some, some children with thin jaws. Um, at the top, these guys have, have um, also been on modern foods. Um, Seminole Indians, again, uh, very rich diet. Um, probably don't need to go, how long do we have, by the way? Well, mm. I, I, probably flick through a lot of more of these, but this is another one of my a good picture really shows the long thin face. Um, and you can, so, the, the teeth tell the tale. Uh, I mean, <coughs> Dr. Price was a dentist, so it's obviously where he'd begin, but it's something that we can all see. It's very visible for everybody. Um, so, um, when, you, when you have this crowded teeth, there's not enough space for the glands in the head. Think about the pituitary gland. Uh, various things like that, um, poor eyesight and hearing, um, the functions, uh, the organs don't work so much. Um, childbirth is a very interesting one. Women's pelvises, as we've um, changed our diet, have shrunk. And um, these traditional people didn't report any problems with childbirth. Um, South Sea Islands, oh, the, this is my, these are my favorite ones. And th these guys had a really rich diet. Uh, again, a, a lot of the tropical fruits um, are very high in saturated fat, so actually the most saturated fat product is, is coconut oil, um, yeah, believe it or not. So, um, you see the lady on the top right, she was reputedly in her, in her 90s, and there were a lot of elderly people in, in these um, communities, and they, they were very sturdy, very, um, you know, sound of mind, and they would carry out key functions in society. Um, the, the, the idea that you would end up in an old age pensions home and, and be drooling is, is really a modern thing. And, and, and one, one thing to bear in mind is that the concept that we're living older now is really um, government propaganda promoting the NHS. The government control our, our healthcare now and they, they really want us to believe that they're giving us a longer life. But when you actually look at the records, if you take out death in child labour and if you take out infectious diseases, which we've solved through um, hygiene, you got past those, you would tend to live longer than now. And you look at Victorian graveyards and they've got the proof. There's lots of 80s, 90s, 70s. And, and the major thing is that people would not only live slightly longer, but they would be productive longer. And You've probably all got stories of grandparents or grandparents you know of who were farmers who, who were farming until their 80s or even beyond. Um, I'm going to skip through a lot of these because, um, yeah, gives you good ideas. So you went here into Australia as well. Um, beautiful jaws, these guys. Um, and they did top right. Uh, again, that the children here, I mean, you can see that um, with these Aborigines, um, malnutrition there. Um, 
And th these guys don't have tooth decay. These guys, the one on the top right, they file their teeth down, and they still wouldn't get tooth decay. And, and if you think about the Maasai, for example, a very rich diet, they eat um, blood and, and fermented uh, raw milk from their cows. That's literally all they eat, but it provided them what they needed. Uh, he did find a, a largely vegetarian tribe, but the interesting thing was he actually started this thinking that vegetarianism would be good, because even back then it was quite popular. He couldn't find them. Um, the one tribe he found in Africa was actually subjugated by the meat-eating tribes. Uh, so they were dominated by them. And, and, and you find that in India with the caste system. The lower castes are all uh, and more vegetarian, not allowed meat, some of the, you know, the untouchables. Whereas at the top, they, they eat meat. And, and, and interestingly, India is often brought up as an example, but the, the Indians in, uh, not Indians, but, uh, yeah, but in, in, in the north, where they have a very rich diet with lots of buffalo milk, which incidentally is about double the fat of, of cow milk, there's a lot less heart disease in the north of India than in the far south, where it's more vegetarian. Um, so, uh, terrible. Um, some of these are quite disturbing, some of these photos he took. Um, again, really quite disturbing. Um, and and, and this, this shows, <laughs> you know, side by side. Um, and, and you can really, you can compare this to uh, architecture. When you put the right design in, the, the right, um, the right building blocks. You've got this beautiful architecture, and, and the human body does have that if we'll only allow it to express itself. Um, yeah, various dense deformities. I actually have the one on the top right there. I, I was a vegetarian from about the age of 11 to 17, um, so I suffered from that. Got a good start, but you know. Um, so uh, th this lady, American, she, she has um, obviously this beautiful wide jaw, teeth fit in. And what you find is that when, when the jaw develops properly, people, they, people, if you see people like this, just look at them and you'll see how easily they smile. Um, the, the other people, when their genetics haven't fully expressed themselves, they look like they've got a chip on their shoulders. And, and this is, you know, they, they find it hard to smile. And you see a lot of kids nowadays. Um, she, she didn't eat insects or you know, various things like that. She ate whole raw milk from a Jersey cow, uh, sourdough bread, lots of um, nutritious butter, uh, meat, um, liver, um, think, and cream, think, things that, um, oh, bone broth as well. But, but, but things that are quite palatable and, and very traditional in our diet, you know, that, that you don't need to eat all those things that the traditional tribes are eating to get this healthy diet. You know, the, our local farms are providing a lot of this stuff. Or well, eggs as well, you know. Easy, easy source. Um, and here's, here's the mom children. You, you see this all the time. You should compare these people to, to that lady before. Um, and it's become popular. You know, um, the media is, is now promoting, look at all these skinny models, uh, long, thin, gaunt faces, and they don't smile. Um, now, uh, th this, this lady, uh, her, her mother had crowded teeth, but she took on the Western A Price approach, and it, she, she brought up, up children, you know, she, she reversed it. Some of these things can take a couple of generations, but the, the, the next generation of, of um, people having nutrient-dense diets it will turn around. Um, and, and we actually have a healthy baby gallery on, on our website and on our journal. All the members just showing off about how well behaved their children are, how delightful they are. They, you know, they sleep well, they don't cry, they don't get all the illnesses, they learn quickly. Um, so it's pretty charming. You know. um, so natural beauty. This is a quote from Dr. Price from his book, <coughs> which, you can, which you can buy on Amazon. There are some online copies as well. Individual beauty is a matter of both design of the face and regularity and perfection of the teeth. Nature always builds harmoniously if conditions are sufficiently favourable, regardless of race, colour or location. Now, back in his days, this was quite radical because the mainstream um, um, science was saying that this is all genetics, you know, mixed race, all this kind of uh, pseudoscience that was coming out at the time. Um, 
You're probably more confused than when you started because all those different people ate different things. Uh, some had plant foods, some had uh, some had no plant foods, some had not many animal foods. I didn't really go over those, but tended to be more tropical ones. Um, incidentally, tropical fruits tend to be more tropical plant tends to be more nutrient dense, which explains why. For example, coconut, you know, really rich, which w would explain why the more tropical you are, probably the more vegetables are eaten. Um, some had mostly cooked foods, some had a lot of raw foods. Um, the, um, the Eskimos would, would eat their fish fermented and raw quite a lot of the time. Um, some had milk, some didn't. Some had grain, some didn't. Yeah. So what are the underlying characteristics? And that's what the, um, the next part of the presentation is about. But um, since we're going to change tack a bit, if anyone's got any questions. Right, so th these are the characteristics. We'll go through it one by one. Number one, there was no refined or denatured foods. Um, and, and the problem is, this problem's become worse. In the 1930s, when Dr. Price was seeing all these things, which were you know, big changes in society, all the illnesses, the crowding of the teeth, tooth decay, there weren't many uh, refined foods, and we've got so many more today. And I'm sure a lot of you have looked into a lot of the artificial foods um, the corporations pushing them and how toxic they are. Um, every diet contained animal products and as I said um, this was a, a disappointment for Dr. Price. He, he really hoped to find that. Um, but, but you look at the whole range. Um, so animal foods, what, what's only in them? Um, AD, cholesterol, Cholesterol is a nutrient, and we'll go into that. It's really been wrongly demonized. Vitamin B12. And, and the, these are the fats which you know, we're told not to eat, but they actually have many functions in the body. Um, you've probably heard that these come in vegetables, but they're actually vegetable analogues, which quite often um, are counterproductive and do the opposite to the animal ones. And um, a lot of um, things that are in um, plants are more easily absorbed when they're in food in, in animal products. For example, you know, calcium is a lot more absorbable in milk than it is in cabbage. Um, vitamin B12. It, th this is only the, the the analog we need is only in um, animal products. Um, the deficiencies. Um, caused many, many problems. And um, one of the reasons that some people can be a vegetarian vegan for longer than others is because the, this is such an important um, thing for the body that the body can store up to 12 years worth of, of, of B12. There are other people who've got only one or two years. Maybe it's their, um, the diet they've had previously. So some people can last 12 years before getting sick on a, a low-nutrient food diet. Mm -hmm. And other people, it's just a year or two and they'll have problems. <coughs> Um, vitamin B2 deficiency, Th these are all the um, problems. Um, you know, I don't have time to go into the functions of this. There are articles on B12 on our website. I um, don't know if any of these seem familiar. Um, right, um, th this was just an <coughs> example of, of a lady who, who um, she, she only came from a tribe where they only drink fermented milk. That's it. <laughs> so you don't... It, it, um, the, the, the point here was that if you're a vegetarian, you can get these nutrients from egg yolks, from um, from raw milk, butter, cheese. So you don't. We we we've got a gripe with veganism. Vegetarianism can work. Um, although there are some people who have problems um, like zinc. Um, there's some other things that red meat provides, which. There are certain people who need some red meat in their diet. Um, now here's the key finding. When, when you analyze the food, four times more calcium and other minerals, 10 times more fat-soluble vitamins. And you imagine the diet, the, the average American diet back then had a lot more fat than, than our politically correct low-fat diet does now. So the multiples may be 20, 30, 40 times now, we just don't know. 
Um, sources of vitamin A and D. Um, seafood is a great source. And um, land, animal, grass fed. Now, vitamin A is generated um, in land animals from eating green grass. They convert um, the, the, the carotene into, into, bit, into the animal vitamin A. Um, and vitamin D is from the sunshine. Um, so, you know, that you will not get this from factory farmed animals. Um, and this is one of the things that the animal welfare groups really miss out a trick on. These um, factory farmed um, meats, they're, they're not good for us and they're not good for the animals. Um, cholesterol. Now, you guys probably have looked into things like eugenics, so this might kind of make a bit of sense to you. Uh, a lot of, a few things might click into place. All of the reproductive hormones are produced from cholesterol. Oestrogen, testosterone, progesterone, the body produces them from cholesterol. Now, um, th this will probably amuse you, um, but the, the, the Indians, uh, the North American Indians, if they had a couple who were infertile, they would go on a bear fat diet. They would eat nothing but bear fat for a couple of months until they conceived, and it always worked. And you'll notice that all the sacred foods, they're the cholesterol-rich foods. The, um, the liver, uh, the fish liver, the um, butter, the, um, the fish eggs. So, um, this is a, another quote from Dr. Price from his book. Um, so, you need vitamin A and D to utilize minerals in the diet. Uh, and his quote was that it, it's possible to starve for minerals that are abundant in the food that we eat because we don't have enough of these activators. So you, you get a lot of people, they, they're eating lots of veg, they're having lots of minerals in their diet, they're still getting sick. And this is one of the major reasons. Um, we're told, eat carrots, get vitamin A, carotene. Absolutely um, useless information for most of us because the very time we need vitamin A is when the body's under stress and it's a very difficult conversion. Um, it's difficult for children, diabetics, people with all these issues that are listed there. When you're stressed, your body's depleted of um, this. And, and the conversion uses a lot of minerals and a lot of vitamins, so it, it, it affects other processes if you're relying on it. So you really need vitamin A in your diet. Um, and, and this is um, vital for so many things. As I said, you know, the thing about eating lean meat, it, it's used for protein assimilation, used for calcium, proper growth, birth defects, um, just so many things here. Um, we also see the fat soluble vitamins are involved in, all, in hormones, including the sex hormones. Um, we, <laughs> we actually have a bumper sticker at the foundation, cholesterol is for lovers. So, let's um, bear in mind. <laughs> yeah. And there are lots of things that deplete vitamin A. A lot of things which you know just can't be avoided in, in modern life. So we have more need now in, in our modern lives living in a city uh, than, than even the traditional people had. Vitamin D myth. Well, a lot of nutritionists tell me you can get it from the sunshine. What are you worried about? You can't. Unless you're in the tropics, you won't make it all year round. Um, in, in this climate, particularly up north, it's midsummer during the middle of the day. The government tell us to not go out in the sun in the middle of the day. That's the only time your skin's going to make enough vitamin D in, in this country. So you need it in, in, um, in, in your diet. It's absolutely crucial. Um, incidentally, we believe it's a complete scam to suggest that the sun causes skin cancer. I'm going to say a lot of things that are controversial in this talk, and this is probably one of the more controversial ones. Um, we believe that skin cancer is caused by a combination of, but well, one of the things is actually the, um, the sun lotion that we're told to put on. You read the ingredients, it's like um, a chemical factory. And a lot of the ingredients that are actually 
um, affected by the sun, which are supposed to be the active ingredients, they get damaged and, and form free radicals when they're hit by the sun. And we all know that they cause cancer. The other major thing is um, refined damaged vegetable oils. For example, vegetable oils are cooking in, and also margarines. Um, I'll get into that in a bit more depth later. Um, so, sources of vitamin D. Um, now, fish liver oil is a difficult one, and I just want to briefly touch on that. Most uh, fish liver oils nowadays are highly processed, and again, they're polyunsaturated oils, so they're very delicate. There's only one brand that we recommend, and uh, it's Green Pastures, and you can buy it online. And this is uh, raw and fermented, and it's um, a lot of the modern uh, fish oils and, and fish liver oils, cod liver oil, they, the heat treating destroys the vitamins. So what they do, they used to take the vitamins out, process it and put the vitamins back in. And now they put synthetic vitamins in to replace it. Um, so, uh, the fat of pigs, and um, now, but again, this is only free range pigs eating proper food. What do pigs do? They're out in the sunshine all day, lolling about sunbathing. They're creating a lot of vitamin D. And the organ meats are very rich in vitamin D. That's where you're going to find it in the fats and in the uh, organ meats. And insects is an interesting one. So you can eat insects by proxy. If you've got a free range chicken, what are they eating? I mean, they do eat a bit of grass, but if you watch one, they're just running after bugs. They're just, you know, eating, eating um, worms and, and, and flies and bugs, and they, they just love it. But insects are very rich in vitamin D, and, and that transfers into the yolk and into, the, um, into the, the fat of the chicken, which incidentally is in the skin, and people take the skin off to have a low fat, lean chicken breast. That's one of our chief hates, is skinless chicken. Uh, many roles for vitamin D. Um, but you know, this isn't too controversial about vitamin D, because it's universally agreed that, um, that we need it where we disagree with the mainstream is that they say, get your vitamin D and have a low fat diet. It's like saying, have your cake um, and eat it. Synthetic vitamin D, again, this is what's added into a lot of the fortified foods. It does the opposite. The body can't use it. Skin is chicken breast there, so that gives you an idea. Um, so you're looking at two, Six, eight. You're looking at about a quarter of the vitamin D if you strip the, um, the, the skin off your chicken. And, and look at, um, oh uh, yeah, vitamin A, sorry. And chicken livers, and this is why we emphasize liver as one of the top um, foods to have. You can see how much vitamin A is in there. Incidentally, this is why liver and bacon go well together. Um, our taste buds have developed over millions of years, if not longer. Yeah. So. Um, I mentioned that vitamin um, D is prevalent in pork fat. Vitamin A is, is, is in chicken, uh, in, in all liver, very high. So the vitamin A and D actually work together in, in, in synergy. So that's why those two work together. And, and in fact, if you just ate, um, chicken liver's not as high in vitamin A as some of the other livers, but you could get vitamin A poisoning if you had, if you didn't balance it with vitamin D you know, over time. This is actually a spoof, but we like it, and we, we wish it was real. <laughs> We've got a similar thing up on our website, uh, on the main thing. Uh, Activator X, this is the vis we believe this is vitamin K2, and there's an extensive article on our website on vitamin K2. Um, incidentally, we, we believe this is a major um, therapy for things like osteoporosis. It's really what the body needs to develop um, healthy children and, and good bone structure. And, and it, this works in synergy with A and D. So A, D and K work together. And it's in all these sacred foods I mentioned. Incidentally, all these slides will be up later, so if I flick through and you've missed something. Getting your reduction, the brain. Um, so here's the synergy, very important. Um, food sources, goose, duck, chicken fat, 
Have any of you had chips? Um, uh, 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 any of you had roast um, potatoes cooked in goose fat? Yeah. Tastes really good, doesn't it? Um, now, um, sauerkraut's an interesting one. It's a vegetable sauce. The vitamin K is not actually coming from the vegetables. Does anyone, has anyone had um, raw sauerkraut? Um, well, there's only one com company, well, there's two companies I know that make it in, in, um, in Britain. One of them is Cultured Probiotics. And I'll, I'll give you the website later if any of you get into this. But it, it's a, what you do is you add salt to the vegetables. It draws out a brine and then the vegetables ferment. And the bacteria that are fermenting all the sugars in the, um, in the cabbage or, the, or whatever um, vegetables you've got, they produce vitamin K. Um, and, and it also turns it into a, a probiotic, very potent probiotic food that helps digestion. And this is what people were eating throughout the winter. Very healthy food, um, high, in, high in salt. Incidentally, in Hungary, where they just brought in this fat tax, it, it targets salt. And a lot of these, um, you know, people are still peasant farmers out there. Their uh, sauerkrauts are being targeted by this, um, this tax, which is being proposed over here. And, and we'll go into it later how salt is not the demon that, that it's being made out to be. Refined table salt is not recommended by us, but I'm talking unrefined sea salt and unrefined rock salt, like the Himalayan salt, the Celtic sea salt. Um, this was Dr. Price's favourite picture, a very happy girl with um, fish eggs. She's up in the Andes, thousands of feet above the sea level. These people went to such strength, uh, such effort to, um, to get these um, sacred foods. They'd send people all the way down to the ocean to trade whatever they were making to get it. And again, Dr. Price said, why do you do that? You've got all this food locally. He said, well, we know that if we eat this, we're going to have healthy babies. And every culture said the same. Um, th this is actually the... Um, the fermented um, cod liver oil we mentioned. Um, there's another place that does it as well. Um, and, and it's actually got high vitamin butter oil. It's another, th these are really the only supplements we recommend. Um, and it was a member of the foundation who decided to start producing these. The butter oil um, takes, remember in, in, uh, in Switzerland they were taking butter from uh, cows eating fast growing green grass in the spring. Um, so they take that grass, uh, they, sorry, they take that butter and they centrifuge it to get the oil where all the uh, vitamin K is. Incidentally, um, there's, there's also a lot of cultural things around these things. In Switzerland, the, the first butter of the season would be taken to the church. They'd make a candle and light a wick and have a ceremony once a year, you know, the, the, when, when the sacred food had come. Um, and I, this is what actually one of the, um, I mean, probably a lot of you are very sensitive to, you know, maybe corporate um, trends destroying cultural things, which really ties together. And a lot of the sacred foods formed really key parts of our cultures, rituals, things people would come together and, and celebrate, harvest festivals, all these kind of things. Uh, and we've lost a lot of our culture when we've uh, turned our back on our traditional foods. How much um, cod liver oil? Well, we say about one teaspoon a day of the fermented cod liver oil. And if you're using regular cod liver oil, we do have some recommended brands on the website. You can contact me. You have to double up. If you've got a, an illness that you're trying to resolve, you probably double it. And, and yeah, you can see there uh, that, that there are all these um, And uh, incidentally, if you read Dr. Price's book, he goes through lots of case studies of people with terrible rickets and other things that he cured with the combination of this, um, these supplements and um, nutrient-dense foods. Um, I won't go into this. It's just about how to take it if you don't like the taste. Um, brain development. I mean, a, a lot of you probably know a lot about... Um, that, that we're pretty much being dumbed down, I think. I think probably a lot of you would agree. Um, a lot of these things are crucial for brain development. The brain is actually 
Now, you, you're going to freak out when I say this, but has <laughs> any of you cooked brain before? This used to be quite popular years ago. It's almost 60%, it's about, how much percent fat is it? About 60% saturated fat. Saturated? I'm not or sure. Or saturated whether, mono as well. Yeah, yeah, it's not entirely saturated, but a good proportion of that is. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, Elizabeth is actually a nutritional therapist, um, local um, <laughs> nutritional therapist, um, who's um, really been getting involved in the foundation as well, so that's why she's come down, she's really useful for me. Um, so the brain is almost entirely, you know, it's one of the major components is, is, is fat. And then you look at the myelin sheath around the, um, the brain cell. That is produced primarily from cholesterol. Now, we, we, we believe that statin drugs and the low-fat diet is, is one of the major causes of, um, of dementia in our, our elderly people. And this is a terrible affliction if any of you have had a parent who suffered this or a grandparent. And a lot of it is the brain's just not getting the nutrients it requires. Um, and that I, lots of studies show that the, the nerve cells, they, the myelination is what it's called, where the myelin sheath is formed. This is like the insulation for a, an electric cable. So the, the, they don't fire properly without it. That continues right the way through old age. It, it's only limited really by malnutrition. Um, again, liver. Um, nothing really is higher in nutrients. Um, and, and, and again here we, we mention here about how, how it's traditionally eat, eat, eaten and a lot of those things like you've got liverwurst is a, is a kind of um, sausage where you've got the pork fat, um, pate, you generally put the pork fat in with it, um, bacon. Um, so calcium, and this, this is an example of how if you compare getting all your um, certain nutrients from animal versus um, vegetable products, um, you'd have to have 78 slices of white bread to get the average daily dose. Four and a half cups of almonds. Does anyone fancy having 40 carrots? Um, but five cups of whole milk, that's about a pint. We have sources of unpasteurized milk. Um, there's actually a health, quite a lot of, at seventh day, don't they do raw goat's milk? Yeah, raw goat's milk. Eighth, eighth, eighth day, yeah. right. Eighth day do raw goat's milk in central yeah. Manchester. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of dairies nearby. You can get it mail order. Have any of you heard all you, the you recent can, stuff? You can also get it if you, there's the Mrs. Kirkham's Lancashire cheese stall on the market. Yeah. You go and speak to the guy, he'll bring you like a drug. Oh. Yeah. Not necessarily 100% yeah, like, like, grass fed. I think it's Frisian right. cow, so it depends how picky you want to be about the raw milk. Yeah, well, it's usually the Holsteins that are mm. uh, only grapes, so that's probably all right. But um, you, you can get raw, raw cheese as well in most supermarkets. Um, email me if you want to know about getting unpasteurised milk. And have any of you guys been seeing recently in um, <coughs> you know, Patriot Radio shows and <coughs> alternative websites about the raw milk raids, raw some raids, all that kind of thing? So you're probably very aware of this, and and it, it was the Western A Price Foundation that that really been pushing this for the last um, 15, 20 years, I think. Um, and, and Dr. Price was really hot on raw milk back in the 30s as well. All cultures cook their food, but ate some of it raw. Um, but it, we're talking about animal foods now. A lot of the raw food movement is raw vegetables. We've got a bit of a problem with that because a lot of vegetables are difficult to digest in their raw state. Um, so we tend to either cook them or have them fermented and raw. But we don't generally eat many raw food. One of the one of the um, the ones which doesn't fit into that category is salad. But salad has dressing with it. Now, um, olive oil, which you put in the dressing, is rich in digestive enzymes, and raw. Um, so, uh, vinegar it has rich in probiotics and enzymes. Salad itself is not. So there are ways of getting around it with condiments. But anyway, the, the reason for raw animal foods, well actually I'll go into the reason next, but these are examples. Raw milk, butter cream, raw marinated fish. You look at, um, oh, what's the uh, raw salmon? Oh, 
um, gravelax. Gravelax. Yes. Yeah, you know, lots of cured <coughs> dishes like that, and cured meats as well. Um, oh, I, I've missed a slide there. The reason is is vitamin B6. And I don't know if that comes up later. Oh yeah, here we go. Vitamin D6 um, causes a lot of problems. Now our diets are extremely low in vitamin B6. And you look at diabetes. The reason diabetes is because you need B6 to metabolise um, carbohydrates. So it's part of you know, using natural foods to overcome these modern diseases. Um, and, and most people don't have any raw meat, raw, raw animal products in their, in their diet. Um, that's our campaign for Real Milk website. Just You'll recognise that if you go realmilk.com. Uh, raw cheeses, great way of getting it. High levels of enzymes and beneficial bacteria. Well, I touched on that with the sauerkraut and with the um, salad dressings. Um, I'll just start by, by mentioning about Louis Pasteur, because we talked about raw milk and everyone talked about pasteurising. Louis Pasteur developed pasteurising um, for the wine industry to, to give them more shelf life, and it was never really used for wine in the end, it ended up being used for milk. He had a, a debate with, um, with a contemporary um, who believed that the opposite to Pasteur, that it wasn't that microbes cause disease, it's that when the conditions are unfavourable, that pathogens arise. So you're talking about when you've got mineral deficiencies, when you've got toxic overload, when you're malnourished. Um, microbes are attracted to you, so it, it's, it's not the microbes that cause the problem. And she said it's the terrain that creates the, the problem. And, and one of the most famous, although not now, one of the most famous U-turns in medical history was Louis Pasteur on his deathbed. He said, ah, she, I forgot her name. She, she was right, it's the terrain. And then he died. <laughs> I think he's talking about Béchamp. Béchamp was the guy who kind of discovered, well, he sort of had a, a theory about germs before Pasteur. Oh, right. And basically Béchamp always said it's the terrain that's important, not the germ. Mm -hmm. And then basically his name has been sort of erased from the books about sort of germs and, and then it was, that's why, where he got that idea from, why he renamed wow. on his deathbed and sort of said, yeah, Beishamp was right. That's amazing. Um, and you'll notice that he was working with the wine industry, so there's industry involved. Yeah. Maybe that made him, didn't make, meant he wasn't impartial. Um, examples of enzyme-rich foods, so raw and fermented dairy products. Our favourite was things like kefir, um, yogurts, um, raw cheeses. Raw honey is great. Um, people pasteurise honey, it's antimicrobial. Mm. I mean, this is crazy. Obviously, it gives it a longer shelf life because it will ferment over time. But raw honey is great. Um, tropical fruits are high in enzymes. Um, temperate fruits aren't. So, really, when you have temperate foods, you, you, your people should love hearing this. You want to eat it with raw cream, yogurt. Um, all the things that taste good that people have um, traditionally that you have fruit with. And everyone knows that uh, fruit tastes great with a dollop of cream. But try it with raw cream from a grass fed cow and you will never turn back. Um, olive oil I mentioned earlier. Wine and unpasteurized beer. You'll notice I have a beer in my hand. Um, we're not against alcohol. Um, obviously, in, in excess amounts, it can be silly, but. Um, real ales and, and real wines, they have enzymes which help us digest our food, so it's perfectly reasonable to have a little bit of beer with your food. And if you don't have any other um, probiotics with your meal, you might as well just order one. Um, we, if anyone wants to get in touch with us about sources of getting, you know, people who produce fermented vegetables and things do get in touch. Um, so the old paradigm, the, the pasta paradigm, that the healthy, that the body's sterile and microbes attack it, you know, these are the enemies. The new paradigm, and, and this has become quite popular now with like Yakult and things, which we don't promote by the way, um, that, that there's a synergy, we, we work with microbes. And in fact, there's a lot of arguments that when we're sick, we call microbes in to do um, certain things, and it's when the problems become embedded that then it becomes pathogenic. Um, six pounds of healthy bacteria, and this is about a couple of kilos 
of, of bacteria in a healthy gut. And it actually forms this kind of um, layer um, of the gut wall. And there's actually more um, microbes in the body, more DNA from microbes than there are human cells. So arguably, we are almost like bacterial communities with, with a human uh, framework. And um, so we need to be really good to these guys. Um, you would actually die. If you killed all the microbes in your body, you couldn't digest, lots of things wouldn't work, you'd die. And there's examples where they've made um, animal guts sterile and they just drop dead. And, and you'll notice a lot of the toxins that you guys probably are very aware of, almost all of them, they, they kill bacteria in the gut. Um, I talked about this earlier. I shouldn't have gone into depth at the beginning about this one because it's quite a little bit complicated about. Um, you know, a lot of um, the modern diets, they say, use whole grains. Well, a lot of the whole grain products haven't been prepared properly. This is about soaking them to, to neutralize. You're tricking the seed into believing that it's landed on fertile ground. So the digestive inhibitors in there, phytic acid is the main one, they, they become neutralized. And once that's neutralized, the, what they do is they, they hold onto the minerals like a clamp, like a claw. And um, they, they stop the digestion from getting to them. So they, when those disappear, the minerals release into the seed and it's ready to sprout. And it's already re also ready to be digested. Um, there's lots of other things that are broken down. Gluten is broken down when you make sourdough. But everyone's getting gluten intolerant. Um, herbivore stomachs. Well, this is a great story. But, I mean, th these tummies are designed for breaking down grains and, and um, vegetable matter. Human stomach. You know, th this has got hydrochloric acid in it. It's designed for breaking down protein and fats. Um, and, and you know, arguably, probably our ancestors primarily had their plant matter either cooked or, or fermented, and you know, pre-digested pre really, because the, the, the human stomach doesn't have those six components to, to you know, break down cellulose particularly. Um, here's the comparison. Now, a gorilla is is um, a ruminant as well, uh, with all these multiple stomachs. Now, I'm going to do a little poll here. Um, well, see if somebody put the hand up and shout out. How much fat do you think um, a gorilla has and a cow, all, all herbivores, how much of their energy content do you think is fat once they've digested their food? Anyone care to guess? Go on, one person. Just whatever comes to your head. 70%. My goodness, that's pretty good. <laughs> it's about 80%. <laughs> I'm, I'm really impressed. I was completely speculative, yes. No, it's great. <laughs> but most people would say it's very low because they don't eat any, any meat. Because they're herbivores. Well, the cellulose is broken down in, um, through the fermentation into short-chain fatty acids, into saturated fat. So when a cow has digested the grass, it's almost entirely saturated fat. And that's how you know, milk is, is so rich and cream and things. Uh, here's an example of sourdough bread. I mean, you can actually buy it in Manchester. Yeah. Whereabouts can you buy uh, it? Barbican and Unicorn in Charlton. So. Oh, yeah. I don't um, know about central Manchester. I'm sure there's other places. Eight, eight days. Eight days, eight days of yeah. London. Uh, you know, Waitrose do it. We, we don't want to shop there, really. Um, th this is a sourdough <coughs> starter. What you do is you, it, it, you mix... Um, there's lots of stuff on the web about how to do this. But you mix um, flour and water and leave it out and stir it every day. And eventually it will it'll attract yeast and it will get bubbly on its own accord. And um, what you do to make the sourdough is you, you have to feed it every day, so it's like a little pet. You can slow it down by putting it in the fridge. But you, you put a scoop of the, the sourdough starter in your, with your dough, you mix it in and you leave it overnight and it slowly rises over about 24 hours or sometimes shorter, sometimes longer, depending on how you do it. So that's how, that's how it works, it's a long process. And the modern process came in when corporations took over from family bakers. They used to run about you know, three shifts, so it's a 24 hour operation. And a big corporate baker said, no, we can't be bothered with that. So they brought in yeast and, and they, they bake it in an hour or so. Um, soy, uh, does any of you know about problems with soy? Um, th this is quite popular in the vegetarian world. It's being promoted as a health food. 
thankfully with Monsanto being exposed, various things like that, people are starting to become a bit more suspect. Um, it's got more of those toxins than any other grain, pulse and legume, than, than anything else. Um, all these, lo lots of things that are terrible there. Um, and if you have it in high, high quantities, there's lots of um, estrogen mimickers. Um, but it's not entirely that story. Um, because in, in Japan and China, they do have soy. They have in very small amounts. Um, the, the high toxicity of it means that when you ferment it, it's a very long fermentation, a very intense fermentation that takes one to two years. And, and the product of that is an extremely potent probiotic. In the East out there, they don't really have dairy products, so this is their probiotic. They have on average about a spoon or two a day as condiments with their meals to aid digestion. This is their probiotic food. And it's very high in vitamin K2. There's only one company I know in Britain that does uh, fermented soy, misos, uh, source foods, miso.co.uk. Um, really good company, it's organic, uh, which is important, uh, because the, the genetically modified stuff is absolutely terrible. Um, oh, and, and sometimes soy sauce, you, you'll look on the packet, it will say it's been aged for two years in a cedar barrel. It's probably pasteurised though, so it won't necessarily have the benefits, but at least it won't have all the toxins if you have a bit of it. Um, Soy-based infant formula, um, absolutely terrible. Um, this is giving the giving babies the equivalent of um, you know multiple birth control pills a day. Um, not as popular here as in the states, but it's a disaster for children. Um, uh, this is a good book on it, good website. Um, Kayla Daniel, she's done a lot of work on it. Um, so there's a lot of stuff to look into if you want to research that more, or if you have vegan friends who are eating lots of processed soy. Next point, so the fat content varied um, between 30 and 80 percent, but only about 4 percent of the calories came from polyunsaturated fatty acids. These are the ones we're being told to have. I mean, you've all seen the flora margarine adverts, um, high in polyunsaturated fats. Well, we don't think that's a good idea. That 4 percent would come from the small amount of you know, legumes, from vegetables, in its natural form. Um, so. The, the many roles of saturated fat, this is why, why you know, there should be more emphasis on it. Um, it's used in, the, it's one of the, half of the uh, cell membranes are saturated fat. Um, the bones, I mentioned bone marrow earlier, and about osteoporosis, how this is really a fat deficiency on the I believe. Um, it's actually good for the heart. If you get a heart from a healthy bull that's been eating grass, it's surrounded by saturated fat, the body puts it there because it's, it's the perfect food for the heart, um, the liver, uh, it's, in fact, you know, um, although we're not, we, we don't promote um, drinking excess amounts of alcohol, we believe a lot of the liver disease today is actually uh, non-alcoholic related and it's due to fat deficiency because the liver requires fats, um, you know, as you saw, that. Vitamin A is very rich in the, in the liver, so you're going to have to consume a lot to, to fuel the liver. Um, so, you know, it causes a lot of problems. And, and we, gallstones are caused by a fat deficiency as well. Um, th that's quite an interesting one, because a lot of people suffer from it. But what happens is, um, bile is produced by the liver from cholesterol, and it's used to digest fat in the, in the um, colon. I think it's colon. It's more intestine, it's more intestine right. And then, um, so when, when the body doesn't have enough cholesterol and fat, it can't produce an, enough um, bile on demand. So it stores it all in the, um, in the gallbladder. And, and, and it's trying to conserve cholesterol, basically. But once it's been there for too long, the gallbladder becomes inflamed and you get crystallization and the gallstones develop. And if you go back on a nutrient dense diet, reintroduce these fats, nourish the liver, the gallstones will dissolve. You don't want to chop out the gallbladder. It's very important to regulate when the uh, bile is released into the um, digestive tract. And so if you have trouble digesting fats, it might be that's the problem. And, and there are articles on our website about that.
the, the lungs are almost entirely saturated fat, you know, not entirely, but it's one of the major components. They can't function without it. Kidneys, all, all the, um, the, the vital organs. Incidentally, this is one of the reasons why saturated fat cannot be the cause of the obesity epidemic. A lot of the fat we consume is, is used and forms uh, key parts of the body structure. So not all of it's used for energy. And, and you've seen all the roles of saturated fat earlier. It stimulates metabolism. So um, the, the best analogy I have is that farmers feed pigs skimmed milk to fatten them up. If you feed a pig whole milk, it will become lean because its metabolism will be pumped up. It will start burning its energy and won't have any fat on it and, and, and will sell for less at the market. Um, and, and this is the study that, that's um, generally cited. There's lots of studies, um, and, and we go into a lot of them, but this is a key one that's cited um, about the you know, justifying low-fat diets. And this is a quote from the director of the study, and they actually used this to justify low-fat diets. In Framingham, Massachusetts, where they followed the whole village through generations, looking at what they ate and, um, and, and their health, the more saturated fat one ate, the more cholesterol one ate, uh, the more calories one ate, the lower people's um, cholesterol. And, and the more um, cholesterol they ate, the more saturated fat they ate, the most um, th th they weighed less and they were more physically active. Th th this really shows that the less saturated it is, the more fragile the, the fat molecules are and the more damaged they become. Um, and, and here, you know when I was saying that polyunsaturated oils are more fragile, um, when they're processed they become damaged. If you go to a health food store, all the seed oils and veg oils are cold pressed. And there are actually people buying cold pressed rapeseed oil and then cooking with it. This is ridiculous. Phil, can I just get yeah. a really quick point? Yeah, sure. When you, when you see cold pressed oils as well, they're always in dark glass bottles. Yeah, That's absolutely. because they need to be protected from heat and light. But what do we go when we go and, and cook? and expose them to large amounts of heat um, and therefore completely change the nature of them. They become toxic, they form free radicals very easily and they also connect with other proteins in the body and cause all sorts of chain reactions. Yeah. So have, if you have you know, polyunsaturated oils in small amounts, good seed oils, then you have them cold pressed and you have them cold over food. You don't cook with them. It's crazy to cook with polyunsaturated oils really. Absolutely. And, and you know, this links back to what I was saying about skin cancer. Um, the body is not designed to have these processed oils in vast quantities. So, well, it's not designed to have them at all. So, uh, the body doesn't know what to do with them, and it incorporates them into the fatty tissues. Um, you remember I talked about the uh, chicken skin, where the fat's just under the skin. So, it, it gets you've got all these um, damaged fats, free radicals, in that layer. And, and, and we, we believe that to be a major cause of, um, of, of skin disease, skin cancer. And, and you notice a lot of the other places which, where you get cancer um, are, are fatty organs, the brain, the lungs, all these other places. So the body just incorporates those inappropriately in the fatty organs and they, they cause it to malfunction basically. Um, again, here, th these are trans fatty acids which are produced during the processing. And I, I mean, this kind of makes the point, you don't need to read through it. This is what they do to veg oil to make margarine. Absolutely toxic. Um, here's arteries um, just showing on the left. And you've got good fats and on the right. Um, so we, we actually believe that these um, rancid veg oils and things, they cause the, the hardening of the arteries. Um, the, the cholesterol, cholesterol's blamed, but um, cholesterol is one of the primary building blocks of the cell wall along with saturated fat. So when you have damage of the arteries, the, the liver is signaled to send cholesterol to that place to do the repair. So it's always there, but we believe that blaming cholesterol for heart disease is like blaming firemen for the fire. Well, when firemen are always there when there's a building burning, but you don't say get rid of the firemen because this is cause and effect, it's not. And these are all the problems, that, I mean so many problems, I've just, there's no point going through them right now because I could spend all day and we've got lots to go into. Um, but they, uh, th this, this diagram shows how the, um, 
the, the, the rigidity of the cell wall is provided by the clash on saturated fat and the gaps where things come in and out are the polyunsaturated and which is why the 4% makes sense, the 4% because that's about the percentage that they they're required in, in the cell wall to provide a little bit of flexibility to let things come in and out. Um, and so here you go, the comparison of modern and historic diets. And, and, and here's the natural natural sources of the polyunsaturated oils. When, when they're in their natural form, they're encased in all various different parts of the, um, the, the food, so they're protected. But as I said, you know, when they've been processed, they're exposed and they become damaged. When you've got a bit of polyunsaturated oil as part of a, a bean or a fruit, it's, it's protected by the, the uh, plant cell wall and you'll be fine. Um, omega-6 and omega-3. Now, this was this is one of the few things that the Western Aid Price Foundation have promoted that the mainstream have picked up on. Um, and you compare this omega-6, omega-3. The omega-6 comes from these... Um, uh, polyunsaturated oils. Um, and and I, I talked earlier about the, um, the the animal welfare issue, that it's also a human welfare issue. You, you're out of work, you, you, you might as well drink veg oil if you're going to have a battery egg because it's they're, trans, they're, they're having, they're fed primarily on grains so they incorporate the polyunsaturated oils into their fatty tissue into the egg yolk and things, and, and they become just as uh, toxic. Not as bad, but it's um, it's still causing a lot of problems. And it's the same with all factory farmed animals. Interestingly, it's also the same with um, badly grown vegetables. You get omega three, omega six coming out of wax. So if you've got organic vegetables, the oils in the in, in the vegetables are going to be better for you as well. Um, grass fed versus grain fed beef. I've actually been to farms in southern England where the cows are out on, on mud in the winter and they're fed grains and then they take them inside the barn in the summer and grow maize and then feed them maize from the field. Absolutely bonkers. <laughs> this is what's causing um, what, what this is what's causing a previously healthy food to become absolutely toxic and frankly to give these animals a terrible life. We've got the biblical link there. I mean, there's another biblical link there where, um, I forget what it was, but maybe God got a, a gift from Cain and Abel, I forget who it is, I shouldn't quote these things, but one, one of them gave him the, the fat, like the fattest lamb, uh, and the other one came with vegetables, and God said, I don't want those, I don't want the lambs in the Bible, uh, and you know, they talk about the fat of the lamb. Anyway, it's, it, there's a lot of tradition going right back about all this kind of stuff. All diets contain salt. Now, the, the new proposed fat tax that David Cameron, apparently he's a conservative, a bit more yellow, I think, uh, wanting to tax our food, apparently to help us, but it's going to um, tax salt. Now, table salt is not really ideal because it's, it's processed, there's some damage that occurs with the heat treatment, and, and all the good minerals are stripped out of it. But it's still not quite the uh, demon that we're led to believe. Um, unprocessed sea salt has all the minerals the body needs in electrolyte form. This is the form the digestion tract breaks down minerals into prior to assimilating them into the bloodstream. So you bypass needing to do that digestion. It's, this is why when the British tried to take salt and tax salt from Indians, there were riots because they knew they needed it and they used it for curing their meats and, and fermenting their vegetables. So the traditional diets were, had quite a lot of salt. Incidentally, I believe that body odour is uh, a symptom of salt deficiency because uh, we excrete excess salt, I say excess salt, in, in our sweat and salt is bacteriostatic. The new um, holistic um, deodorants are made from salts. Um, you know, <laughs> so um, I, I believe that one of the results of uh, taxing salt is going to be a lot more smelly people and a lot of money to the perfume companies. Um, so the, the only thing the body does when you, when you limit salt is, is it will stop excreting it 
and it will hold on to the salt. Another thing was cultures made a massive efforts to get salt. Um, Dr. Price found Africans in the African plains who would um, find uh, marsh grasses that they would they would burn to get the salt from them. So, and, and we saw people up in the mountains getting sea salt. And it, even if it was the only thing that they brought in, like the Swiss tribes. Oh, and it also salt um, activates digestive enzymes, so it helps your digestion. Um, but, but this is another thing that is just so common, um, that the processed food is demonised and the government will not tell us all about the traditional alternatives. Yes, that's right. um, these are all the things that's needed for, don't need to go into it. Um, traditional salt pressure. production, you know, very wholesome. Uh, we promote the Celtic sea salt, which is dark coloured. The, the, the salts that you want to be getting is not the white salts, it should be, um, sea salt should probably be grey, the rock salts are pink. This is a sign that you've got the minerals. Um, that's just an example. Um, traditional cultures made use of bones, uh, usually bone broth. It's also become popular now to do, you know, celebrity chefs are doing um, bone marrow cooking that. So, you know, you, you put your, uh, the, you reserve the bones, put them in, um, in water, put a bit of salt, a bit of um, vinegar to the acid helps, and you, you just boil it, and, and this makes the sauces that traditionally we've made um, gravies, soups, all the really tasty sauces that, which, you know, particularly in like French French cuisine, or you look at um, the gravies we have with our dinners, really really okay. important. And, and <coughs> otherwise, we just throw them away, and, and people shouldn't. Um, it's one of other than dairy. It's one of the only really good sources of calcium in the diet. Um, obviously, it's going to be good for bones and, and cartilage. Why the heck doctors don't tell osteoporosis sufferers to have bone broth? I just have no idea. Um, they, they, they give them powdered calcium, but that's about it. And the gelatin also helps digestion. We, we've got a doctor we work with who, who deals with uh, mental disorders all the way to autism, and she, she actually successfully treats them and turns people around to being fully functional people. Uh, and one of the major parts of her um, protocol is bone broth. The gelatin soothes the gut wall. Um, I, I, should, I should give the background that there's a gut-brain connection. Uh, there's actually more nerve cells in the gut than there are in the brain itself. And almost everyone with a mental disorder has a really bad gut and has got uh, allergies and various things. So we, we intervene by taking out the things you can't digest adding natural fats which um, the, the, the gut needs, bone broth, the gelatin, helps digestion, provides the gut wall everything it needs to regenerate. Then you add the probiotics and then slowly you can reintroduce things as you heal the gut. And that will actually resolve things like depression, schizophrenia, um, autism, lots of things. The, the protocol is called GAPS. She's got a website, we've got videos on our website about it, um, and there's a book, so you can look into it. Um, this is just explaining about how they aid digestion, so I won't get into that. Um, lots of things that it, it helps. And, and, and this really summarises what I was saying earlier about the mixture of things for the gut. Traditional, sorry, I, I'm, I'm skipping through fast now because I, I want to get through it all. So. Traditional cultures always made provisions for future generations, and I made this big point when we went through the slides of the um, traditional people. Special foods reserved for parents to be, pregnant women, nursing women, growing children. Um, there was also spacing of children. Um, generally, if a woman had given birth, they would spend a couple of years rebuilding their body before they uh, would have another child. Um, so obviously it takes a lot out of you. And um, you know, we spend a lot of time teaching proper diet to young people. And um, that's not being done much today. And when it is being done, they're being taught politically correct nutrition, which is only just going to cause harm. Um, just an example of somebody who's gone miles and miles to get the, the, the sacred food. So making your own salad dressing, a lot of salad dressing. Right, so we, we've gone through the general principles now, actually. So. Um, this part is um, about 
changing your diet for the better, just a couple of key points that help. Make your own salad dressing. Most salad dressings have these veg oils, omega-6, really bad oils. So just make your own, your own um, unpasteurized um, vinegar, your own olive oil. Switch to butter. If you're going to do one thing after tonight, get just chuck out the margarine. It's absolutely toxic. I did a protest down in London uh, last year, um, which was really fun. But there's, there's a horrible doctor. Actually, he may not be horrible. He may not know what he's doing. I shouldn't be so nasty. Um, there's a doctor, Colvacar, in the heart hospital down in, in Soho, who came out in the news and said, if we ban butter, you know, taxing's bad enough. He wanted to ban the stuff. If we ban butter, we're going to save X amount of lives. He didn't explain all the dairy farmers that would commit suicide. But, um, but the amazing thing was, we, we found out later that the um, PR company that made the press release was Flora Margarine's PR company. And I've heard rumours that there was some kind of funding thing going on, but that is completely alleged. I never said that. Also, nobody eats butter. Nobody eats butter, so how can he have blamed it on butter? Yeah, that, that's absolutely true. No, I mean, no after, a few, it. after a few generations of eating eating badly, then yeah, you're absolutely right. Let's blame butter, but nobody eats it. So that's why we go back to Dr. Price's work, looking at what traditional people are. Yeah, it's in everything. <laughs> Don't you sell anything without it? Yep, we sell cigarettes. <laughs> Um, and and this, this is exactly what Elizabeth was saying. Um, this is how the diets change with fats. Uh, and um, you know, a lot of these diseases are modern diseases we're dealing with. Um, make sure you have high quality animal products. Um, we're talking grass fed, um, wild fish, and, and you know all the principles we've been discussing earlier. Um, it's a good, good comparison with eggs, you know. It, you can afford grass-fed eggs, everyone can. Um, incidentally, this is slightly out of date for... Uh, it, it's, not, it's not entirely true for England. In America, you can be organic without being free-range and grass-fed. In England, the Soil Association requires that... I think it's something like 60% grass-fed. So, if you can choose organic, sometimes it's a good option, but... The best thing is to find a good local farm, farmer's market, where you can actually maybe even visit and you can speak to the farmer and ask them what they're doing. So, you know, a lot of these foods that we're talking about, they're great, but don't just remember the name, don't just remember chicken liver. And, and one of the things to bear in mind is that a lot of these foods are the things that people cast away that cost nothing, that, that are very cheap, that the butcher will give them to you. If you go to the average fishmonger, they'll just give you a, a fish carcass to make stock with. Um, so if you can have probably afford, maybe you can spend the same amount of money by and improve your diet. So it's also true with the, the cuts of meat. The most fatty cuts of meat, which have, we believe, more nutrients, like you look at belly pork, it's about half the price of pork chops. Um, and frankly, I think it's more tasty. Um, and we've got resources. Wow, I'm coming close to the end there, so... We've got a quarterly magazine if you join. Um, it's only about £30. Uh, but all the articles are online on the website. Um, and we have the annual conference. Um, there's one in America, and I run the one in London. We've done it for two years, and I'm hoping to keep that going. Lots of books. Um, right. We do recommend you look into this book. If you, it's a great travel book. We have a United Nations vegetarian agenda. Um, you can just Google this, and I really do apologise for vegetarians in the in the in the audience because I, you know, it's just what I do. Sorry, <laughs> but um, so yeah, just do a Google search. The Guardian UN urges global move to meat and dairy free. As I said, you can you can have a healthy diet, vegetarian if you have to. Anyway, moving on. No conversation I had earlier. Right. <laughs> Um, but one of the more, more um, insipid, I mean, some of these people say do it to, um, to save yourself. And, and other people, 
including Lord Stern saying, give up meat to save the planet. And I, I think a lot of you might, you know, alarm bells might start ringing there. Um, and um, what you find a lot of the time with um, global, global government is this kind of global local. So, um, I mean, Brighton's a, a particular hotspot with um, the Green Party getting in there. But they're, they're pushing meat-free Mondays, and, and they're trying to get this to be a quite trendy thing. But we were quite, I was quite pleased doing this search to find that, um, that the, um, fortunately, there's some sensible working-class folks still alive. Um, and and the, the bin men rebelled, and they said, we want our bacon sandwiches. <laughs> so they, uh, they had to drop it for the bin men. Um, um, yeah, and... and um, Funny enough, um, you know, George Monbiot, which I'm, I'm sure none of us um, are a particular fan of, um, he actually had, he, he was in a position where he, he had to do a U-turn. And this was, um, the actual story here was um, Cowgate. I don't know if you heard of that. We've all heard of Climate Gate, right? Well, Cowgate was when, soon after Climate Gate, um, it was exposed that the UN had fudged the figures about um, livestock and, and impact on, on the climate. And essentially what they'd done is that they were saying that um, animals are producing more um, you know, deadly gases than, um, than, than transport. And what they did with, um, with it, they, they looked at the entire cycle, uh, the production line for, for food, and then on, on transport, they just looked at one aspect. So they, they kind of so that this came out, and it turned out that actually transport, it, even if you believe that um, CO2 and methane are, are toxic, um, it wasn't true. The, the whole thing they said was not true. And the thing about methane, um, absolute nonsense, because all vegetation breaks down into methane. It doesn't matter if it's in a ruminant stomach or if it's in a compost heap. It breaks down because the microbe, right, in a ruminant stomach, microbes break down the food. In a compost heap, microbes break down the food. It's the same thing. Eventually it turns into soil. So, um, it, 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 it just doesn't make sense. So, if you took the logic to, its, uh, to the end of it, you would ban all vegetation. Or at least you would say you can be vegetation, but you can't decompose. Um, th there was this crazy claim that... Um, 100,000 litres of water to produce every kilo of beef. I mean, straight off the bat, you know, this is ridiculous because, you know, all, all the world's rivers and aquifers would be completely parched by now. Um, there, there's an element of truth in factory farming because you have to bring in uh, water and you, there, there's lots of grain production to feed the factory farmed animals. But if you have grass-fed beef, most of that water is from the sky, falls on the ground, and you don't have to even irrigate it. Um, so below that, here was the, the thing that it was 10%, not 18% to state by the UN of, of, of CO2. Um, and, and the, you know, if you want to look for a real global crisis, it's losing our soil through factory farming. Um, in, in, uh, in America, before, before we came, they're actually far, far more bison than there are now um, cattle in America. Um, and, and these guys, they roamed around and they, they ate grass, they pooped and grass grew and they pooped and then, you know, the whole thing just went round and round in circles. It was, and, and when the first people came to America, the grass was so tall, this land was so fertile from this, this grazing uh, from the bison that um, you would have grass coming up to your saddle in, in, in your, you know. But then with the with the factory farming of grains and just grains, 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 slowly the, um, the soil just has become depleted and you ended up with the dust bowl. But the traditional farming methods over here in Britain that um, really probably led us to our industrial revolution was the, the crop rotation, where you, you, for a couple of years you grow some grains, some vegetables, and then then you let the ground rest for about five years, and or however long you do it, you know, it's different depending on where you are, and, and you have grazing animals, and, and when they graze, they build up the soil, and um, all this organic matter. 
So the, the whole environmental argument was completely false. And as I've argued before, the human health argument is completely false as well. <clears throat> um, the World Health Organization, um, their diet objectives, well, they, they've got a European action plan here. So that, that's um, the more recent one. Um, this actually followed on from the European Charter to Counteracting Obesity, which is all sponsored by the WHO. And I'm sure none of you are real fans of the WHO. Um, so they're, they're saying that less than 10% of daily energy should be from saturated fat, significant salt reduction. Now we know all the impacts that that's going to have on human physiology from looking at this. Um, you look at uh, fertility, brain power, immune system, um, just general ability to be a human. Um, and, and, and what are you going to replace it with? Well, the only thing left is carbohydrates. And, and we believe that this is the major cause of the obesity epidemic, or the diabetes. And, and they do say, um, fine, well, don't have sugar, but have um, starchy carbohydrates. But all carbohydrates are broken down into sugars. Um, so, and, and there are actually more calories in um, starchy foods than sugar, believe it or not. So you do kind of deal with the roller coaster of the, you know, the insulin thing that diabetics suffer. But you actually end up getting more calories, putting more and more weight if you just pile on the pasta and, and um, potatoes and have no nutrient dense foods. Um, so we, we've got um, they plan for targeted programs uh, to protect vulnerable and low socioeconomic groups. Um, We've actually got a bill coming through Parliament right now, which is called the Public Bodies, I love this word, Sustainable Food Bill. Um, it's not sustainable and it's you know, not good for the public. It's going to force all government bodies to provide, all the food they provide is going to have to be in compliance with this low-fat, high-carbohydrate um, guidelines. This targets the vulnerable people, just as the WHO desires, school children, People who are in hospital are sick. I mean, you, you're going to, you know, you would not believe this, but they actually give high carbohydrate diets through the NHS to diabetics. It's absolute bonkers. I, I've got a, uh, we work with a guy called um, uh, Barry Groves, and he got, he was um, consulting for an NHS hospital on nutrition, and he was working with diabetics, and they chucked him out when, they, when he told them, have a high fat, low carbohydrate diet. Um, and so you look at elderly, you know, all the people who are vulnerable are going to be targeted with this. And, and it, it's, um, and I think you can probably create the connections there with, with other certain agendas, um, you know, eugenics and things like that. I almost don't even need to explain it, it just, it just all fits into space. So the European Charter on Counteracting Obesity, this was. Um, um, the World Health, right, initially this came from America in, in about 75. They adopted this through the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture. Their sole mandate is to promote American agricultural products. And no, we're not talking about the products of family farms. We're talking about the grain cartel. So the WHO then adopted the American guidelines which came from the corporations. And now they're trying to enforce it on the whole planet. Um, this really is world government for and by the corporations. Um, and, and through Europe, it's the European Charter to Counteracting Obesity, which was signed in 2006. One of the things that our government signed up to were economic measures to facilitate healthier choices. And that's exactly what we see with this proposed fat tax. Have you all seen the talk about that? Well, it, for anyone who hasn't seen it, they're proposing a tax on any food with more than 2.6% fat. This will target olive oil, eggs, butter, um, you know, <laughs> almost anything. Um, so, Denmark's introduced it. The ironically named Hungary has introduced it. Um, yeah, I, I love this, um, this, this statement here from Thomas Jefferson. He's one of my favourite politicians. Um, if, if people let the government decide what foods they eat and what medicines they take, their bodies will soon be in a sorry state as the souls who live under tyranny. And um, the reason this is true is because government policy invariably is informed by corporate lobbying. We don't 
you know, when was the last time a politician asked you uh, your opinion on anything? It just doesn't happen. Um, so, um, you know, I'm, I'm not a big expert on, on the sort of the conspiracy side of it, which I know you guys are into, but I think you can create all the links there. We, we've got a, a big issue here in Britain with foot and mouth and BSE. Uh, I don't know if any of you have heard of the conspiracy about these. And this is a huge one because the government used it as an opportunity literally to bring in martial law. We had the army coming in to farms slaughtering animals. I mean, this is a horrific use of an army uh, which is supposed to be to protect us. So you, you'd hope, just like with all these nutritional things, that they're doing the right thing, but this isn't true. We promote... Um, there's a lot of articles on, on our website, by, actually four articles, by Mark Purdy. He's a, unfortunately, he died of um, fast-acting cancer. Um, and it, there were a few attempts on his life, actually. Um, he, he was an organic dairy farmer who, when he heard that the government were going to force all farmers to use organophosphates, Probably everyone knows that that's, it just sounds bad. If you know what organophosphates are, absolutely toxic. Incidentally, they're used to treat nits in children. Not very good idea. Um, so what he found was that, what, what, one of the terrible things is that the organophosphates were mandated to eliminate a fly which actually was not causing any human health issues or even animal health issues. It was really a non-issue that could be regulated quite easily just by better managing dung heaps and things like that. Um, so he said, well look, you're going to strip me of my right to be an organic farmer because I cannot get organic status and use organophosphate. So he sued the government and he was so quick in doing it that he won. Um, absolutely brilliant. So then no organic farms had to use it. And we don't believe it's a coincidence that none of the organic farms got BSE. Incidentally, all through this period that those farms were feeding uh, bone and blood, blood, blood and bone meal, which the uh, government blamed. So, what what Mark Purdy seemed to what he uh, uh, demonstrated, and the Auburn University in, in America corroborated his findings, was that the organophosphates caused toxic overload and mineral depletion, and that this is what led uh, to the prions being formed. It's a false crisis, it, and it was actually created by the government intervention. And the, the the problem is, if you want you want to look at conspiracies, the, there are so many things. It, the, the coincidence. I've written a cup, um, couple of things about this, but the same with the foot and mouth. I mean, the government ordered the pyres months and months and months before the outbreak. Um, the, the pyres that were used to burn the animals. So many so many things went on. The foot and mouth was was worse. Um, it, it was actually deliberately released in, from Portland Down in 2001 uh, from the bioweapons. They were doing a test you know, to see what would happen. Um, and, and we believe that might have been the source of the outbreak. I say we, I mean, this is my own research, really, not the Western Aid Prize Foundations, um, but it's all been published on national newspapers. Um, and, and it's on record that the 2007 outbreak was from the government funded. Institute of Animal Health in, in, in Perbright, Surrey. Um, there was a, a private company that gets government funding and, and it was released. So it was just by coincidence that the out of over 500 strains they have, the one strain that was released was the one that they were going to mass production for the vaccine of that particular strain that year. Um, you know, so many things happened that just weren't right. And from the back of that, you've had a literal police state being um, imposed upon farmers. Um, you know, farmers now, they're not allowed to use blood and bone meal. Even though you've got, like, um, pigs, which are actually omnivores, they're being forced, um, you know, vegetarian diets, which isn't really that good for them. Um, and now um, farmers aren't allowed to slaughter their own animals to sell on their own farm. Um, and, and, and what they've done, the regulations have shut down all the small local abattoirs. And, and so you have to go to the big big ones where all these animals are put in together. So, you know, there's no 
human health benefit to that because if there's any outbreak it's just going to spread like wildfire and and the key is farmers were punished absolutely punished no regulations for the bioweapons industry or laboratories in fact the, the mail found that the leak which they blamed the outbreak for in 2007 on somebody came back a year later and said well look, this thing's still leaking <laughs> absolutely unbelievable um, I've written an article actually on, on my website, I can email it to some people if you want, about the uh, foot and mouth, getting all the things that come out from all these articles. Um, that, that's actually, have you noticed Sorry. that um, it's not only uh, obesity, but some, th there's kind of a, a split between some who respond by being completely gaunt and thin, mm -hmm. and almost anorexic, and then others who, who are then just kind of balloon. But the, the, the dental thing is fascinating because what I'm now seeing in friends of mine, my generation, who have had kids, is that there's a terrible, den the dental problems are unbelievable. Um, you know, children who are, have got real kind of problems with overcrowding of teeth, teeth poking out straight through the mouth, so they're not being enough room for teeth to push through. My own little brother, who's got all sorts of health problems, has got two sets of teeth. So he's got a rogue set of teeth coming up. And he's in his early 20s, but, you know, he was a victim of the sort of the low-fat hypothesis. And I just think that was in the, you know, the 80s. What on earth is it going to be like? It's going to be yeah. absolute carnage. It is going to be carnage. Well, I, I think it already is now because um, a bit the, the, the problem, and, and this is something which, um, which is worth making a big point of right now. Um, pro, um, Weston Price isn't the only guy who's read in for this. Um, there's also the Price Possinger Nutrition Foundation, who are great as well. Possinger um, did this study on cats, and what he did was he, he fed one lot um, pasteurized milk and um, cooked meat. And the other one he gave raw meat and unpasteurized milk and cod liver oil. So, I mean, the, the diet's not important, because cats eat different to us, so that's, that's not the issue. The issue is, is that one had a, a good diet and one had a bad diet. Uh, and what he found was that um, they, they lasted three generations. Uh, once you got to the third generation of a poor diet, um, they could no longer produce uh, and they would just be sickly. So there would not be a fourth generation. Um, and for a lot of people, we're getting to the third generation. I mean, the problem with modern medicine we're different. We could probably go for a fourth, fifth, sixth generation, but each time. And one of the reasons why it gets worse generation to generation is because um, the mother and the father pass on their gut flora. And as I mentioned, we've got more microbes in our bodies than human cells. So you, you, you send a, an impaired gut flora down, uh, and the next generation will not develop as much as the, the previous one. And it, it just keeps getting worse and worse until you address the root problems. Um, so, but, I mean, it, it's quite horrifying thinking in that way, Elizabeth, because I, I was looking at these kids today, um, I think it's worse when you're in a big city, but almost ev all the kids I've seen today are wearing braces, mm -hmm. and, and they've got this kind of, you know, the, the face, that you, you it, it's just signature, and then you think, my goodness, well, these kids are pre-fat tax. <laughs> and, and you think about all the new GMO foods and everything which is being introduced now, uh, and you think, well, how bad it is now, the levels of autism being so high, um, diabetes in children. I mean, sight problems as well. Lots of little kids with glasses. Glasses, yeah. yeah. And, you know, the also reason, immune diseases as well. But also glasses is diseases. interesting because the retina has got one of the highest concentrations of vitamin A, which is a fat soluble vitamin. So that, that's one of the reasons why a low-fat diet causes sight problems. And it's high insulin levels as well. High oh. insulin levels in the bloodstream during when you're pregnant can have a knock-on effect in terms of stopping the proper formation of the, of the eye. Yeah. Uh, just like as well, it's a lack of UV light as well. It's mm. not a lifestyle. <laughs> right. Like getting yeah. in there as well. So, yeah. you know, not spending any time on calls as yeah. well, which would be like... That's a good point, yeah. ...shutting time. Mm. I mean, I mean the, 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 the demonization of the sunshine is just mm. something that I've always found incredible because, you know, we, we'd never have survived as a race, particularly with our tropical roots, if, um, if we were allergic to the sunshine. It's getting kids out in the sunshine as well, because yeah. there's, uh, 
there's been like a psychological warfare on, on keeping kids in because mm. there's yeah. stranger danger or this yeah, nonsense, you know. Yeah. So kids don't play out anymore, they don't mm. burn fat off, you know. They, <laughs> They've got this sedentary lifestyle where they're sat in the house, not getting any sunshine, playing computer games. And not interacting with each other either. There's no socialisation yeah, going on. Yeah. So it's a weird for a bunch of sun worshippers though, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quite. You might not get that one too. But, but, yeah. but, All right, you got it there, right? Yeah, oh, right. Right, right, right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I know, I just said. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bit ironic. Yeah, I like that. I think. Well, well, they worship the sun and they keep us in the dark. Yeah. Maybe. Um, yeah, the, um, so, um, w when you look at all those, those things, I mean, one of the things I've noticed, um, and, and it's been quite a recent awakening, really, the last five years, um, I mean, I, <laughs> you know, while, while I'm here, I set this thing up, because, I, I mean, the first thing that shocked me was, like, learning about that the 9-11 story doesn't fit together, it just doesn't. And I, it just sent me down this kind of wormhole, and and I, I, I discovered really that there aren't, there's just almost no sacred cows left because every every place I've when once you apply this logic of um, you know corporate agenda that kind of thing, and you start start thinking for yourself, there's almost nothing. Everything we're taught at school is. Um, it's just policy. For example, I, I took a business degree, and I learned after learning all this stuff that I was being. I went in there because I wanted to run a business. I wanted to be an entrepreneur. You know, I wanted to be productive. And I realised afterwards that I was being taught how to be a government agent within a business because I was being taught how to be an accountant for tax purposes, HR manager for um, you know the, all those regulations for human relations and things. Um, yeah. Right down, you, you can tick off the list, almost all these things are effectively um, posts within corporations which the government require, and that's what we were being taught. We, we weren't taught how to be an entrepreneur. Um, you know, the same if you go to agricultural college, they'll teach you about how to use uh, pesticides and how to, how to use the new fancy thing which traps the pig so that it doesn't move. Um, I saw that when I got, took a tour of agricultural college, and that's actually one of the things that made me a vegetarian, um, you know, unfortunately I didn't, that was, those were the years before farmers markets, so a lot of things have actually improved, believe it or not, but, you know, almost every single area, I'm a town planner, and um, it, it causes a lot of problems for my career, because, I, I'll just give you a little hint of this, but I'm into historic conservation, old buildings, because I think they're just amazing, they're a real expression of, of, of human potential. Um, all the buildings, almost all the buildings we protect, all the areas were constructed prior to a planning system being here. <laughs> They're pre-planning system. So, I mean, I'm not going to go into that issue, but you can see that then, well, if you take the logic a bit further, the, the entire system I've just been taught is, uh, is false. And there is, there is another reality that, that existed before, and that could exist again if, if we we could discover it but like almost every single area but the reason I'm going into this is because um, if you look at the agenda with dumbing people down if you start questioning things that whole system doesn't work so if, if you have um, a, a diet which depletes the brain of what it needs to process things and I'll tell you what um, my, my brain has just gone tenfold faster since I changed my diet. <laughs> I, I used to be quite sluggish, really. And, and it's just, and my, my ability to kind of, and, and it's almost like um, through changing my diet and things, it's almost as if I can't not think about things. Whereas before it was a struggle uh, to, you know, I was more of a sponge kind of absorbing um, what, what come, came through university, the, the media and, and all these things. And, and I, I do think that th this is where I come back. You know what I said to you about it's, it's a confluence of things. So I, I think it's dangerous to labour one point, but there is certainly a section of society that wants us to, to not be thinking. And there's another section that wants to make loads of profit, and there's another. But they're all kind of, yeah. it, it, it kind of combines in this, 
this one area. Well, as much as you're talking about diet affecting your brain, and you, you could also talk about the pharmaceutical industry and how um, pharmaceutical drugs are being pushed on people and being pushed on younger and younger people and the physical effects that has on the brain as well. And that, that's also got a dumbing down effect long term and you wonder where we'll be 50, down, well, 50 the, years down the line. The, I've got a couple of things which are quite interesting about that. This is um, um, a, a kind of medicine developed by Steiner. And um, the theory is if you suppress the symptoms of, of a disease, that the disease will express itself in yet more pathological ways. Uh, Dr. Natasha Campbell Bride so, puts this perfectly. For example, asthma wasn't a deadly disease and still we started using inhalers. And, and the actual role of asthma, it closes the bronchioles, they get healed and then they reopen. But when you keep taking it, they can't heal. It's just one example. So you, you, you kind of, we, we do keep going a bit further with the pharmaceuticals, but the more we just suppress symptoms, the more um, new diseases come and then you get new things for that and it just layers on and on. Um, but I, I spoke recently to a dentist, holistic dentist, and he said that a good friend of his had a tour of one of the big pharmaceutical companies. And, and this, the, I think it was the CEO who showed him around because he was a top medical guy. And he said to the guy, oh, gosh, you know, this is amazing, this facility. You, you're spending so many millions of pounds. Surely within a few years you'll be able to cure all the diseases. Mm -hmm. And he looked at the guy, he looked at the medic and he says, we have no intention of, of curing the diseases. Our role is to manage them. This was actually said, and, and this guy, I, I believe what he said because, you know, he's, um, he's a guy I trust, basically. Yeah. And, and um, you know, we all know that to be true, but when you actually hear it from somebody, it, it gets all the more shocking. It's controlling the disease for a long period of time rather than fixing it, which isn't as profitable. It's not profitable at all. In fact, one of the most profitable drugs at the moment is statin drugs, which, as I explained, they, they cause dementia. And they cause muscle wasting. Ironically, the heart is a muscle, <laughs> and they're supposed to um, deal with heart disease, which you know, just doesn't make sense anyway. But um, that's one of the most profitable drugs, and um, heart disease is not being cured by them at all. You've heard for years that um, people have always said, "Oh, we'll never find a, a cure for the common cold," and, and the reason they wouldn't want to is because of the beet tumors and this. And Paracetamol and all the, all the huge amount of pharmaceuticals that um, are used to treat the, the symptoms of the common cold. So it's, you know, it's there. People, and, and the thing is, people outside this room already know it anyway, as well as people in it. Isn't a lot of this kind of, oh, this is what they've done, oh, aren't they terrible? Like, correct me if I'm wrong, but we're getting rid of them. <laughs> well, that, that's what the yeah, idea of this talk is. Yeah. Like, yeah. like, you can get really bogged down with like, oh, they've done this to us, and oh, they're trying to push this agenda, and you're talking about, oh, in the next ten years they're going to do this. No, they're not. <laughs> they're not going to be here in ten years. And it's kind of, it's a, for me anyway. The way I see it is, it's a matter of changing the mentality. Stop believing in them. Yeah, but just but stop believing in them. At all, it's the whole thing is illusion. Government's illusion. Mm. These 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 governing bodies, the UN and, and and all these things that control that say what food you should and shouldn't eat, it's all illusion. So correct me if I'm wrong, but if they're doing all these terrible things, why should we put any power into into what they're saying? I think all the same thing is until, until we learn about it, and then we can start putting power behind it. Yeah. You know, well, I, I just I just think true. sometimes we do no, by, by going ooh. They've done this, and you're right, they have, but sometimes I feel like that, that we're feeding it. No, no, I, I completely agree with you, and what, what I'll say to that is that the whole purpose of this talk is to try and empower you to make yeah. your own decisions. And, and, and all these, all, one, after watching this, and if you, maybe you want to look into it further, maybe you don't, but next time you read an article about nutrition, you'll be able to read right the way through it. It no longer affects you. Um, one thing I'd say... Just, just a slight counterbalance. We're mammals, and, and mammals learn through their parents. If your parent doesn't tell you to be wary of something, you won't be wary of it. Um, the, the, the greatest. You learn through experience as well, yeah. though, don't you? No, through experience as well. But um, um, I, I, Alan Watt always talks about this. I don't know if you know him. He's great. But he, he explains that um, you know people haven't been told to 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 be 
wary of government. It, it's now become trendy to be pro. Um, but the, the, I think the example he gives is like the dodo, which was not didn't have an experience of humans, well, didn't know to be wary, didn't run away. Um, but I mean, we, we need we, we need to kind of educate people about it. But I think as long as it focuses on understanding, counterbalancing it with saying, well, that that's the false reality. This the, and, and the big problem you've got um, where you get negativity is where you've got the false reality but you don't match it up with, well, this is the, the reality that we're going to move towards. And, and hopefully, I've given people a bit of, you know, at least a starting point to do that. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's like you said, not accepted. It's like you have time. Yeah, no, it's definitely interesting. I just think sometimes... No, I, I completely agree. This period is over. Great, let's just get rid of it. I mean, th these people don't affect me anymore. Um, the big, the thing I'm worried about is the taxation issue, um, but you know, it still won't change what I do. Um, I'm still going to be healthy, and I, you know, I'm not going to have kids unless I, I get my, you know, I'm going to get my good foods, right? Mm -hmm. And even if I sacrifice other things, so that unless they you're absolutely right. Mate the planet. Well, yeah, but then that then and just, your you food know. is radiated. And, and it's covered in chemtrails <laughs> and, and you can't get any aluminium vitamins. and barium and, well, you and know, strontium. But you know, apart well, from that, yeah, well, yeah cool. You can have uh, your healthy veg. Yeah. Well, what, what, I will, what I will say is that um, the um, the things that best fats, natural fats, are some of the best protection against um, against EMF radiation as well. I mean, you know about EMF. Um, in fact, won't, won't you? Um, this is quite a good topic because Elizabeth's actually doing a talk at our next conference on, on EMF, which is a, a big issue. And it kind of links in with how the natural foods actually protect us against all these other modern things. I mean, maybe just mention a couple of key things. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a talk at um, the Western Price Conference in London um, next March. So, I mean, my thing is very much a fringe phenomenon, which is people who, generally speaking, have multiple chemical sensitivity and electrosensitivity, so that's when they are overloaded with chemicals, they can't tolerate perfumes, bleaches, sometimes they are so severely affected they can't tolerate household chemicals or they can smell the synthetics, you know, they can't tolerate wearing synthetics. And often these people also have a whole other syndrome which is um, basically allergic to the modern world in the sense they can't tolerate Wi-Fi, I used to be like this, they can't tolerate um, mobile phones. Some of them are so seriously affected they can't tolerate televisions, hair dryers, vacuum cleaners, telephones, and live in virtual seclusion. In fact, if anyone's got any questions, um, you know, anything that you want me to elaborate on or go into, or you say black pudding's back on the menu, then basically. Black pudding's great. In fact, blood is a very good source of vitamin D. Um, I eat black pudding, and um, it's a lot cheaper than sausages. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, again, you know, you want to find a good farm that, that's, um, you know, grass-fed base farmer that, that farms ecologically, work, you know, properly looks after its animals. Um, but as long as you make sure that you've gone to the lengths of getting a good farmer, you, you, you're all set. Yeah. Not the whole organics fine in this country. Don't need to, but just like free-range pigs. Yeah, yeah, in fact, it's not necessarily, so if you find a, a good farmer that does free range, you chat to him and say, do you, do you, use, do you use routine antibiotics, do they feed, eat the right stuff, uh, and you start, you know, get to know them, and, and you'll soon get to know whether it's a good place or not, yeah, that's my worth, opinion. It's probably worth mentioning, isn't it, that a lot of, of small scale farmers can't afford organic certification, which yeah, probably that's very guys true. you probably know, so, but, you know, just if you would kind of make sure that their farming practices, you say, are sort of on, on kind of message and they, they eat grass and they eat the diet that nature intended, then it's kind of better than organic in some cases, isn't it? And, and if you can take the time to go out and visit the farm, and if you walk around and you see a lot of wildlife in the farm, you know, the, the, the animals look healthy, the, these are things just to, you know, look out for. Incidentally, the Soil Association used to do that, but now they, um, they just look at the paper trail, which is one of the reasons a lot of farmers have moved. It's a lot of the small farmers, not only the cost, but it's another reason a, a lot of small farmers have moved away.
because they've been a bit disillusioned. It's just like really expensive as well. Really expensive. Yeah. They take a commission on every sale. So it's not necessarily the case that it's going to be organic if it, to be good. You, you want an honest yeah. farmer that's farming naturally. And a lot of the farmers markets are the places where you can get it. And there's a lot of good companies doing mail order now. And, and you can get it all, all in bulk, particularly if you've got a, a good freezer. You know, it's a really good way of doing it. And in fact, um, on, on that kind of track, I'm going off on a tangent, but um, if you do have a big freezer, you'll get um, like a whole or a half sheep or something, mm -hmm. and you'll get it literally a quarter of the price. So some people are doing that. And quite often, they'll throw in organ meats that other people didn't want. Shameless, Whatever you want, they'll just give it for free. Uh, so that's what you do. <laughs> shameless plug. But yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, your um, yeah. Well, Primal Fitness. Prim primal Store. Yeah. Oh, yeah, this is great. Um, I've just been told about this today. Um, you're linking up with um, a collective of... Yeah, a collective of fans in Pendle. I don't know if you know, you're familiar with the area. Yeah. It's so like Lancashire. Not so a collective of local farmers and what they're doing is picking out the cheaper cuts, the organ meats that other people don't want and it's good price, it's helping the farmers out. I think it's a great thing and we, yeah, hopefully um, I'm and glad you found out that and, today. And what's that? How can we, how can we dot com that? What's that? On? Uh, what, sorry? What's the website? Uh, primalstar.co.uk. Yeah. 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 So you, you, you'll get your... your um, your box. Yeah, so it's all like just boxes of meat basically to make it affordable. Right. Um, yeah. Like trying to crop. You do an awful box. Yeah. Awful box. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, do, they do an awful box. So which is the, the best buy budget wise. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a lot of awful. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Right. Make sure we write it down in your books. I was quite interested to, um, you, you sort of hinted at this uh, UN agenda to sort yeah. of move towards vegetarianism. Mm. And I was wondering what, 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 whether you thought there was more of a sinister motive behind that. Because also, if, if you think about sort of, um, some of the guys who are heavily um, sort of behind the UN, if you think about the likes of Rockefellers, yeah. they're also very heavily connected to um, sort of big, ag big agri in the States. Yeah. And, a lot, there's a lot of links between the, the big agro companies and the likes of these guys, and so within the um, within the kind of sort of the meat market, if you like, they're sort of taking the nutrition out of it. And what do you think is the reason that, that they might be pushing us towards um, more of a vegetarian kind of option? What, why do you think that that might be? Well, I think um, what you tend to find oh. with um, any any of these kind of globalist um, corporate agendas, there's always a multitude of, of reasons. So you, you've got a confluence of, whenever they pick something to push globally, there'll be um, a whole bunch of people get into a room and they'll say, well, that, that meets my needs, that meets your needs, your needs. They'll tick off the list. And this will be one that did that. So it promotes the grain car cartels. Um, I got into this debate earlier about commodity, um, commodities and, and how, it, how it works with um, monopoly systems. Um, the, the, the problem with factory farming that the corporations have is that it produces overabundance. Now, in, in a true free market, if you produce too much and the quality is too low, the price will plummet and you will not be able to make any money. So if you want a monopoly, first of all you want to get rid of your, the high quality competition, which they're clearly doing uh, with um, over-regulating small family farms. Um, and, and you also have official demand for your products because prices are uh, uh, a function of supply and demand. So if your dietary guidelines are pushing these grains which are being overproduced, it's going to put a ceiling on the price. I mean, you also see them coming with biofuel re requirements where that's pushing up the price of grains. So this is a dying industry. Because they've created a monopoly, um, they're overproducing, uh, they've become too efficient and the quality's come so low that if the government doesn't come in and boost the demand for it, that will collapse and we go back to family, family farms. And the big corporations, well, they wouldn't exist if that happened. So that's, that, that's the profit item. I certainly believe um, that there's a, a eugenics agenda. I believe that um, the UN has, an, they, have, they have an explicit policy of 80% um, population reduction. That's in the biodiversity assessments. Um, and I, I actually think they want more, but we need all these foods to be um, have good reproduction. Now I know some people here who, who aren't into 
we are changed might find this a bit off the wall, but that, that's one of a lot of a lot of things that this group kind of looks into. But it, it's all actually official UN policy to reduce the population, and and you, people try and ignore that fact because it's scary. But it, it takes about ten minutes of an open mind looking on news items to say, oh, well, there's too many people in the world. It's just repeated over and over and over again. Um, you know, and, and these vaccinations. Yeah. Well, the, the back, yeah, I mean, so I, I do believe there's that element. And um, what, what I what I ask you to do is kind of link um, linking with probably your research. And, and you know you know which parts, if you wanted to dominate humanity, you know which parts you would target. You would target the brain, the reproduction. Um, you probably target the immune system. And, and that, these dietary guidelines do exactly that. I mean, there's just no getting away from the fact that even if you don't believe there's an agenda to do it, this dietary guideline will have the same effect. Um, that, that's what's being. And in addition, um, so the vegetables aren't what they used to be, like you're saying about soil nutrition yes. this, these days. So people think that there might be a lot more nutrition within vegetables, but actually. A lot of it's been taken out as well. Well, absolutely, and, and a major reason for that is getting away from grazing animals. And, and one of the biggest fallacies about saying that we're going to save the planet by having less animals, well, if you take animals out of the farm, you don't have natural manure anymore. You've got some compost, but not much. The real nutrients are coming from, from the, the animal manure. And, and also, when the animals are grazing, that the, the there's a number of things that happen. Um, one of them is the biomass that accumulates. The other thing is, I mean, we talk about probiotics for humans. This actually runs through the soil. The soil is teeming with life. And um, the, the good bacteria in the gut of the animal is transferred to the soil. And that, those microbes go down into the soil and break up the rocks and release the minerals for the plants. So there's this whole cycle of life. And we, just, we break that when we take animals out of the farm. So, you know, that's a number of reasons why the soil is depleted. And so when you have monocropped, um, you know, particularly the grains where it's just year after year the same grain on the same soil, each year it's becoming less and less minerals. And, and, and you know, one of the last good minerals we've got is sea salt. And, um, yeah, it's, it's very disappointing to... To see that being sure about that. I was just going to sort of go back to the whole thing about the you know, what you're saying about the kind of reproductive system and that yeah. being kind of one of the ways. I mean, I I don't know, I don't necessarily partake in a necessarily a kind of conspiracy mm. agenda, but I do know that um, I did find out the other day that um, one of the consequences of reducing in Denmark and Hungary saturated fat to seven percent of calories instead of ten percent, which is what it was before is that children, and this is something I didn't really know, children have a compromised ability to um, make um, kind of uh, cholesterol out of other substances. So, you know, one of the arguments for the low-fat diet is, well, we can make our own cholesterol. And we do. We do make our own cholesterol. You can make cholesterol out of carbohydrate. However, if you do that, you don't eat any fat. You get all the problems of eating a lot of carbohydrate and not eating any fat. So metabolically, it's all over the place. But for children, it's even more serious because children, you know, as a, as a fetus and even before conception, like what you were saying, you know, you need an enormous amount of cholesterol to make sure that the central nervous system and the brain evolves, really, in a, in a child. And apparently, the con you know, there's a terrible consequence because children don't have the same ability to manufacture cholesterol out of carbohydrates we do. So you're looking at dramatic consequences in terms of IQ and brain and central nervous system development by denying, you know, by, and, and also pushing the whole idea of that, you know, children over the age of two ought to be drinking semi-skimmed milk or skimmed milk. And, you know, when Jamie Oliver did that whole thing in America called Jamie Oliver's Food Revolution, he was absolutely shocked to discover that there's such a tick box, tick box exercise going on with the USDA schools agenda that children could have, I was telling Simon about this today, that children can have, because they've got to tick a carbohydrate box, a milk box, you know, a dairy box, all the rest of it, children can legitimately have a pasta meal, a white roll, and a blue sugary milk, because it fulfills all these tick boxes. So they have to have a calcium portion, so that calcium portion doesn't matter if it's sweetened and, you know, got loads of artificial crap in it, as long as it's 
this countless dairy portion. So the most serious consequence, I think, for me, in several generations, what I can see, are children. Mm. Because children are getting fatter, um, and there's going to be a terrible consequence, I think, for IQ, and for just overall hu the human potential that we all have, you know, to see this possible problem with the lowering of you know cholesterol and saturated fat in children who need it for their developing brains is absolute kind of carnage really. They just don't realise I, I they do but. I attribute most of my well, well I've got Romania up here to my mum giving me fish row yeah. and, and bone broth mm. when I was younger because my grandma did it. But in nineteen eighty three we adopted the low fat guidelines just after my sister was born. And she so better cut this out. She's photosensitive, so she lives in the dark. The children have been taken away from her, and it's, she lives a terrible, terrible life as a virtual prisoner. This is a very, it's a very fringe phenomenon, but it's becoming more common. I'm seeing so called now more healthy people exhibiting symptoms of this, and what's going on is a number of things, not least to do with the state of their guts, because that gut bacteria modulate a whole host of immunological responses so they can determine whether or not we react allergically to the environment around us. So there is a terrible deadly consequence of what we're doing to our guts by eating dead food, a poisonous food, toxic food, unfermented grains, all those issues and now we're seeing allergies on an absolutely astronomical level. I mean, I'm sure all of you know children who are very young who might be on inhalers, they might have asthma, they might have eczema. Um, so although this electrosensitivity is a fringe phenomenon at the moment, um, I predict that with the advent of sort of, you know, more, more Wi-Fi technology, the fact you can't go down a, a high street or even sometimes a local street without hitting high, you know, Wi-Fi hotspots and things, I think it's going to become quite a serious problem, so it's just a little insight into what I'm going to be talking about in March, so if anyone's interested. But I mean, the, the key thing is, right, that um, getting the probiotics and you're getting the natural fats actually you helps you protect yeah, you against to, those modern Yeah, you have to things. heal the gut. The gut is the big, is the big yeah. issue, and it's what's passing through the gut because it's not sealed. So yes, absolutely, it's about looking at the, taking out the irritating foods that are causing the gut problems and also making sure that you're healing um, the gut through saturated fat, through through natural foods, through gelatin, bone broths, all those kinds of things. Yeah, and we actually promote, there's, there's a couple of fermented drinks like um, kombucha, for example, which um, is, you, you probably know kombucha, it's, Rus well, it's Russian though, but you're Polish. <laughs> right, so uh, you wouldn't know that one. <laughs> 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 yeah. so heavily publicised. Well, it's well, sugar. Well, it's high well, sugar. It's basically a sugar drink. Yeah. It's I mean, like there's some probiotics in it, but it, as well as being sugar, it's very processed. We, we make kefir out of our our milk, our raw milk, and it's there's a simple culture that you put in there, and you can get it on 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 eBay. There's people sell it, and it's just you put it in the milk and it adds this really good bacteria and it becomes slightly effervescent, fizzy and um, like, like a yogurt. And you can make sauerkraut, so mm. you don't even have to add anything to sauerkraut. So yeah. you, you just salt, salt and veg and Yeah, like, or literally not, like you don't even have to add this. Even in Polish shops or Polish yeah. shells, in wherever Tesco has that, you can get this sauerkraut pound for a, like, it depends. Probably, probably yeah. the yeah. pasteurized. Yeah. 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 They've got vinegar in. Mm. What you want is to just like chop up a cabbage, so stick it in a kilner jar with some with some water. You don't actually even have to have salt. You can yeah. make. You can just have the cabbage yeah. and the water, so filter the bottled water, mm. and sit it in a dark place for a week or whatever, and you'll it'll start to fizz, and you just can just pour off the juice, and it's just a wonderful tonic. It's like a kind of pickle, it's got a sort of slightly pickly flavour like Japanese pickles or something. It's quite nice. And it's rich in vitamin C, I think. Yeah. 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 It's rich in all the vitamins and K2. Um, the, um, there's plenty of uh, books we can recommend uh, if anyone's interested in that. And there's a video I've got, Introduction to Fermentation. We had a workshop in London. It's this really cool guy called Sandor Katz. He's actually had AIDS for you know, well over a decade now. Yeah. And he's, he's fit as a fiddle. But he's treated himself with all these fermented foods. We, we've actually, I've actually got some raw milk here. 
Um, if anyone wants to taste something. Yeah, also, kefir. Yeah, the yeah. kefir, yeah. Ki, no, K-E-F-I-R. It's like in this size of, like, big yogurt. Yeah, green stuff. And this is like natural. You, again, you can make it, yeah. but you can also buy it at the eighth day. I'm not like, I yeah. don't work for the eighth day. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true. It's great, it's great to have a good place to get these things from. Yeah. You know, and, um, yeah, absolutely. Is this pastures green? Also, green pastures. Green pastures do the, the fermented cod liver oil and the high vitamin butter oil. Um, yeah, which was the those were the natural supplements that Dr. Price was using that he developed from his studies. He he looked at what were the most potent, um, you know, um, sacred foods, and he looked at the fish livers, and he looked at the um, you know the, the butter from the from the grass spring grass and he that's what he used. But that's that's a great it's probably the only expensive thing that we promote. I mean raw milk is more expensive but at the moment you've it is raw milk and the um the, the cod liver oil that are expensive. They're not mega but that the milk is is just absolutely crucial. Farmers at the moment are getting about twenty five pence a litre. In the seventies they were getting about thirty five pence. And we all know that the pound's been devalued massively. So um, we're losing about eight dairy farms. Uh, um, yeah. it, it's, it's absolutely horrific. But, but we've got dairy farmers selling raw milk at a good price. I mean, I'd buy this for one pound, what, one pound twenty, I think. This is, a really, this is quite a good value one that I get from my local farmer's market. Um, but but they, they can make a good living out of that. Really good living. So there's a farm in Preston, so if like, any of you guys oh. travel through Preston, like one of my friends, she travels by, so she, she just gets like a big crate of it, and then we all just split the cost. So if one of you guys travels through Preston, you could easily bring it down to this meeting, and you can freeze it as well, so you can get a load of it. Just so if you guys want to do a milk club, it's yeah. the, what, um, <laughs> there's, a, there's a group in Bournemouth who they, they, they do that, and, and I think one of them is, is well located and they just, the group pay for an extra fridge, he's got enough space. And they take turns to, to bring the milk down um, in, in a big bulk load. The farmer does really well out of it and they, they actually get their milk at a good price. You can get it mail order, but this one in Preston, they're organic. Well, it's uh, not, I spoke it's to not registered that. organic. Oh, okay. But it's all I, pure grass fed. Yeah. Organic. Like, and it's in Jersey. everything by yeah. name. Yeah. It, it's Channel Island milk, which is... Um, Standard cow's milk is about four percent cream. Jersey milk's about six. <laughs> it is something else. And if you if you try that, th this is um, this is actually Holstein, which is the standard cow. So that's not very creamy. Um, so I, I I do like the Jersey. Milk. My partner, you see, my partner won't don't won't, doesn't even like that because he's so used to pasteurized milk. I tried to get raw milk for a while. He just turned his nose up at it. He said it just tastes too much like milk. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, one thing to bear in mind with um, changing a diet is um, not many people know that the tongue is a very dynamic um, organ. It taste buds shrink and grow very rapidly, uh, depending on what you eat. Um, so, what you're eating, you, your taste buds that receive that, that actually taste the thing you're eating will grow very quickly. It takes a couple of weeks. And that's why people actually do acquire tastes. And, and what you'll find is that people who are on skim milk, it will take a while to acquire the taste of full fat milk. And then when they're on full fat milk, it will take a while to go back. Um, and also, sometimes you eat toxic foods that you eat for a while and they taste fine and then your taste buds slowly become sensitive to the toxins. And, and this is um, really worth bearing in mind. You, you want to ease yourself in with these things whenever you're trying something new. Um, just take it as far as your taste buds are willing to take you and, and remember that they will develop to the taste. And this is why people develop a taste of things like whiskey um, and, and why a tea taster will be really good at tasting tea. Um, they, they, they've developed their taste buds. It's really important. So just, if you know that it's a nutritious food, Never follow your first gut reaction. You know, ease yourself in, but just just get really it. I'm really, yeah. glad. Yeah. 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 I'm really glad to have met you all. Um, yeah.
Would you, would you, would you say there's uh, a culture or country that has that their, their sort of cuisine, if you like, or sort of sticks out more than any that you sort of adhere to, sort of like Spain or, you know, we all say about the Mediterranean diet, is, is this something we should be looking at more? Well, the, the Mediterranean diet is very interesting because um, the, the, the Mediterranean diet that's promoted is not the Mediterranean diet. Um, if you actually, you know, go to traditional people in the Mediterranean, they cook with lots of lard and butter and, 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 and they eat quite a lot of meat. Um, they have, I've spoken to Italians who have so much butter it would make your eyes water. And they are slim as you like. Um, they also fast as well. Sorry. Sorry. They also fast a lot as well. Like the population study in Crete, uh, there were Orthodox Christians who like yeah. spend a lot of time just fasting in general, yeah. which has got like amazing health benefits. Yeah. And of course, that wasn't mentioned at all because it doesn't benefit anybody for you to not consume anything. Does it? Yeah. And they eat enormous amounts of cheese as well. So in Greece, just cheese. Everything comes stuffed with cheese. Cheese is stuffed with cheese. <laughs> Eventually, I just couldn't take any take it anymore. But very, very rich food in Greece, you know. Um, and they smoke like chimneys. That's yeah. another thing as well. They smoke a lot, but of course the incidences of cancer are much lower. So you know, well, who, who knows what benefits are conferred? Smoke by lots and eat cheese. It sounds well, good to me <laughs> so far. Well, so I mean, smoke lots and eat cheese. Well. Eat fat and salt, right? I'm <laughs> well, but 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 I'm the caveat. It. The caveat I think is that the diet, that the lifestyle is a lot less stressful. And I think that is yeah. a big that's a big factor. It's not just about yeah, yeah. You know, the fact that they smoke and they eat cheese. It's also stress is a major factor, of course, in cancer. With, with the smoking, um, I don't promote smoking, uh, say that for the camera, um, but the, the, the lungs are a very fatty organ, and as I explained earlier, when we have too much omega-6 fats and the damaged polyunsaturated oils, processed oils, and cooking with them, um, those damaged fats are incorporated within the lung tissue, and, and it makes them very vulnerable, um, and lots of free radicals. So if you're eating animal fats and things, uh, a good animal fats and lots of vitamins and, and minerals, that, that's going to protect your lungs. So that's why some people can, can live right to their old age and smoke like a chimney. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I haven't looked fully into the issue. I know that Alan Watt believes that it protects against um, you know, chemtrails and things, but I, I, don't, I haven't researched it. I, I don't know if there's any truth to that, so I, uh, please don't leave this room and, 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 and pick up a bunch of Bensons and Hedges or whatever you fancy. But I would say one thing that I'm completely sure of, that if you do smoke, if you're going to have rolling tobacco, I, organic rolling tobacco, it's going to be a heck of a lot better than, than these stupid cigarettes where they just pump chemicals into them. Um, so if you're going to choose that lifestyle, um, you know, you, you've got to make, be really careful that you give your lungs the nutrition it needs and, 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 and just just pick your tobacco wisely. <laughs> and and you, you may be alright, but I, I'm not going to you know, say any more. This has been really good prep for me. I wonder what the Russian nutritionists will make of the fat tax. Interesting. Well, I, th I think they've had their, they had their stick of it during the Soviet years, but we, we were talking about I mean, you're Polish it's, and um, wasn't quite as bad as what they're proposing now, was it? In some ways, with the nutrition. They still allow small farmers to do stuff. Yes, right? but since we are in the European Union, loads of things that we were producing at home, we cannot do this anymore. It was like, in Poland is uh, north, we have a sea, down south we have mountains, in the mountains there are like a special kind of people who have their own, loads of sheep and... Um, they produce a uh, milk from the sheep or goats as well. But uh, it's a special kind of cheese from this sheep and it's produced only homemade and it's like something original and it's banned. Oh. <laughs> you can but you can so you can still buy this somewhere but they have to change all the procedures. You can buy it well. from a corporation. Yeah, it's just, so this is one of the things. Well, it's really it, sad. In Canada, they got rid of raw honey by saying that all bee, all bee producers have to 
create a facility for the health inspector to come. Literally, they've got to have their own bathroom, their own place to sleep. It, it costs so much, you know, only the big outfits, obviously. Please. And this is the kind of thing they do. So, I mean, that's incredible, really. Just amazing. And, and, and so what it, what it, you know, the turnover is probably enough to, to sustain it so that you can feed yourself, be self-sufficient. There's not enough turnover in this kind of operation to, um, to fund, you know, all the stainless steel uh, facilities that you would expect in a corporate processing unit. And, and this is so often happening. And I've heard so many stories well, it about... It hasn't only been allowed to happen because people believe in the bogus statutes that have been enforced upon them. Well, it, it comes down to... So, stop the, believing. Well, exactly. And it comes down to that, like, the Louis Pasteur thing. It's the terrain. You know, it's, you know microbes aren't, aren't the villain. You know what I mean? So, if you, if you, if you understand that um, these foods... That is, yeah, it's a bit chaotic from the perspective of, of a bureaucrat, but... Um, we've done this for thousands of years, if not longer. Um, what's the big well, they, deal? Those bureaucrats, as you put it, they, they've lost the trust, as far as I'm concerned. They've, they they really gone. have. It's gone. gone. Yeah. Absolutely gone. I, I have no so trust. So they can enforce whatever stuff. They can try and say a statute applies to me, but frankly... The, the, I think you're absolutely right. The, the problem is, one of the big problems is, if enough people had stood up and said, this is nonsense... And it wouldn't happen. It wouldn't happen. And, and you're absolutely right that you have to say, this is not real. This is absolute nonsense. We're not going to comply. Now, a group of um, American soccer mums, um, that they, um, they, they're just... Um, well, say soccer mums. They're probably not into that, probably all homeschooling in English, but um, <laughs> they're, they're doing this wonderful protest that uh, in the beginning of next month, they're, at the moment, the federal government has banned interstate commerce of raw milk, um, which means that states where the raw milk's banned, you can't import it, so it's really stopped a lot of people getting raw milk. So these guys, they, they, they're going to buy, get loads of raw milk, go on a convoy, phone up the FDA and say, come get us, cross state lines, yeah. and then drink the raw milk in front of the FDA office. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is the kind of thing people need to do. Yeah. Just call their bluff. Marseille. Just call their bluff. Absolutely call their bluff.